So first I'd like to say thanks to Neil Kashkari for taking the initiative to develop this institute and also thank you for inviting me to be part of this effort. And I'd also like to say thanks to the staff of the Fed who have been so supportive and in particular uh, Danita Ng who actually helped me edit my enormous slide file. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I also would like to recognize four colleagues whose collaborations over many, many years have helped develop some of the ideas and approaches that I'd like to explore with you today. In particular, Derek Hamilton at the New School, Sam Myers, Jr. at the University of Minnesota, Art Goldsmith at Washington and Lee, and Chris Marsh at the University of Maryland. So uh, let me see how this works. Yeah, but I need to figure out what I've got to press. There it is. Okay. So what I'd like to say at the outset is there is a post-racial narrative that continues to inform a great deal of our thinking about the determinants of black-white inequality. And I would submit that this is unfortunate because that narrative, which places the onus of racial disparity on black deficiencies in human capital and behavioral dysfunction, is wrong. Uh, indeed, uh, recently Bill Emmons, I don't know if Bill is still here, yeah, uh, developed an analysis that juxtaposed what he referred to as structural racism as a frame against the post-racial frame and found strong evidence that the structural racism frame better supports uh, the, uh, the, the, the analysis of, of racial disparities in economic status. And then Tom Shapiro and his team at IASP at Brandeis juxtapose uh, the, the, the frame of structure versus culture, and they found that the evidence better supports the structural frame. I think there are two fundamental weaknesses of the post-racial narrative which is described here as suggesting that blacks are enjoined to get over it, stop playing the victim roles, stop making excuses, and take personal responsibility. There are two fundamental weaknesses with this post-racial narrative. The first is that the post-racial narrative obscures or denies the persistence of discrimination. And second, it obscures or denies the sources and consequences of black-white wealth differentials. Okay. So what's the importance of the presence and impact of discrimination? Well, yesterday Bill Spriggs pointed out that all blacks, with the exceptions of those who have completed college, have unemployment rates that are higher than whites who never finished high school. Employment audit studies, those conducted by Bertrand and Mullanathan, as well as Diva Pager, are indicative of the scope of discrimination in employment. So the Bertrand and Mullanathan study, the, uh, the famous black sounding versus white sounding name study, indicates that uh, uh, when, when letters are submitted to employers with black sounding names, they are less likely to, uh, to call those folks back for interviews. Uh, and indeed, even after uh, Bertrand and Mullanathan improved the resumes for the black sounding names, it did not increase the black callback rate. Diva Pager's field experiments in New York City and in Milwaukee demonstrate that among black and white males with similar educational levels, whites with a criminal record are more likely to get a job call back than blacks who do not have a criminal record. In addition, there's a recent study by Sonia Kang and co-authors that looks at real-world practices of job applicants, and they find that identity stripping on resumes, that is, individuals who strip evidence that they might be black or Asian on their resume, actually find that they have increased odds of receiving an interview. Now, I, I can't tell you what happens after they get to the interview, but, um, but in addition, I'd like to emphasize that there are some surprising gaps that occur at the upper end of the educational and occupational distribution. Uh, Janelle Jones and John Schmidt demonstrated in, in 2014 that the, the receipt of STEM degrees is not insulation from discriminatory treatment. Blacks with engineering degrees have much higher unemployment rates than whites with engineering degrees. Now, to be fair, I don't know if these degrees are from comparable schools, but there is a Bloomberg study that was conducted with respect to MBAs in January 7, 2016, where the Bloomberg study reports 
among blacks and whites completing MBAs at Harvard University in 2007 to 2009, that the black, uh, the black graduates started their careers earning about $5,000 less than the white graduates. But by 2015, the racial pay gap had ballooned to $100,000 per annum. And so these are individuals with the same degrees from the same institutions. But there are wide disparities in the outcomes that they experience in the labor market. Moreover, S. Michael Gaddis has conducted a, an audit study of 1,000 advertised positions that combines the names and false profiles or manufactured profiles of individuals that enabled him to examine the interaction between race and the cachet of the institution. So he paired Harvard University with UMass Amherst, he paired Stanford University with UC Riverside, and he paired Duke University with, uh, with UNC at Chapel Hill. And he found that blacks with degrees from the higher cachet schools were no more likely to get callbacks than whites with degrees from the lower cachet schools. Uh, so, so all of this demonstrates that for comparable credentials or comparable measurable levels of human capital, there are significant differences in outcomes that occur between blacks and whites. And moreover, for all the claims that were made yesterday about behavioral problems associated with young black males, for given socioeconomic status, blacks get more years of schooling and credentials than whites of the same gender. I refer you to the work of Patrick Mason and William Mangino on this count. And indeed, if they had taken into account family wealth position, the advantage would shift even more heavily towards, towards, uh, towards the outcomes for blacks in terms of uh, evidence of motivation to pursue higher education. Um, final point I want to say in this context is that the degree of discrimination appears to rise with educational attainment. Okay. So uh, I, I refer you in particular to the research that's been done by Tomaskovich Devi and, uh, and, uh, and a team working with him, which demonstrates that uh, the measurable degree of discrimination actually is larger the more advanced the degree that the individual possesses. Now, this is all focused on discrimination that's associated with employment and labor markets. I've said absolutely nothing about discrimination in credit markets or discrimination in housing. So, so now I'd like to shift our attention to the racial wealth gap. And uh, this slide is one that I think has some fairly provocative evidence. So uh, if you look at the far uh, if you look at the, at the, upper, the upper left uh, panel, you'll see that <coughs> blacks who are working full time actually have a lower level of net worth than whites who are unemployed. Okay. Yeah. All right, so be it. Uh, moreover, if you look at the lower left panel, you'll see that Blacks who are in the third quintile of the income distribution have a lower level of net worth than whites who are in the lowest quintile of the income distribution. But the far right panel is the one that I think is, uh, is most disturbing. Now here what we find is that blacks who have a college degree have a lower level of net worth by approximately $10,000 than whites who never finished high school. Okay. So uh, the educational solution or magic bullet for wealth disparities clearly does not seem to operate here. Oh, uh, this is from the Survey of Income and Program Participation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so wealth, from, for, from my perspective, is the primary indicator of economic security. Wealthier families are better able to finance elite independent school and elite college education for their kids. 
better able to access capital to start a new business or purchase an existing one, better able to finance expensive medical procedures, better able to cope with legal expenses, better able to reside in higher amenity neighborhoods, better able to exert political influence through donations, and better able to withstand emergencies, including uh, low levels of income or uh, volatile income. So wealth in some sense provides people with greater capabilities and opportunities. And so I think it's more important to examine wealth differentials than it is to look at income differentials. In this context, the post-racial narrative is wrong once again, because it aligns with a particular perspective on wealth that suggests that wealth generation is, 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 is primarily determined by individuals' decisions that they make within the course of their own lifetime. <coughs> so the story as I see it that emerges out of the post-racial narrative is that individuals accumulate human capital, human capital levels dictate how high their earnings are going to be, their earnings dictate how high their income level is, and then their savings behavior dictates their accumulation of wealth. An alternative perspective that emerges from a new subfield that I've been trying to develop, which we call stratification economics, says that current wealth is largely a consequence of intergenerational resource effects. And I want to go beyond suggesting that it's merely a question of transfers of funds. That is to say, it's more than inheritances and in vivo transfers. Because there's some other components or dimensions of parental and grandparental wealth that have an effect on promoting the wealth position of the third generation. This includes the timing at which gifts take place. It includes the emotional security and the health consequences of growing up in a family not faced with economic stress. And it includes the other types of advantages that have been described earlier that are associated with families' capacities uh, that are promoted by higher levels of wealth. So from the um, post-racial perspective, the labor market is a decisive source of wealth, but from the stratification economics perspective, the labor market is, has limited relevance in terms of the provision of wealth. Okay. So now let me shift gears a bit uh, to talk about a project that we have developed uh, in conjunction with a couple of branches of the Federal Reserve. Uh, this project is called, <coughs> excuse me, the National Asset Scorecard on Communities of Color. And it was motivated by two different uh, main, main considerations. So the first is uh, that asset markets are local, and so we wanted to design a project in which we looked at the wealth position of communities of color at specific metropolitan levels. And second, uh, although we frequently have information about the wealth position and the economic status of large aggregate social categories like Asians or blacks or whites or Hispanics, it's very difficult to find information about the wealth position of specific national origin communities within those catch-all categories. And so as a consequence, we decided we would try to develop a project in which we could select a set of metropolitan areas that would allow us to drill down to look at these specific national origin groups. So those are the, uh, the motivations for the project, emerging out of the incomplete body of research that's available in the traditional surveys. So, um, so we selected five cities initially, Boston, Los Angeles, the District of Columbia, Miami and Tulsa, Oklahoma, because this would enable us to look at very specific national origin communities in a way that we can't with most national data sets. We chose Tulsa, Oklahoma because it provides us with access <coughs> to a significant Native American population, uh, which is a, a population that is, is largely invisible in national data sets. Okay, so. Uh, so th this, this in turn has generated a series of three reports thus far. One of these reports is, uh, is, is a report on Boston that we call the Color of Wealth in Boston, which was done in collaboration with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. 
A second is The Color of Wealth in Los Angeles, which was done in collaboration with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And then uh, the third is, uh, uh, the third report that we've done thus far is a report on the District of Columbia, which was done in conjunction with the Urban Institute. And the next report up is supposed to be on the city of Miami, and it looks like we will be doing that in collaboration with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. One of the things that we would hope would happen is that there would be an institutionalization of this type of research approach as part of the uh, survey of consumer finance or as a regional Federal Reserve Bank activity that's conducted on, uh, on a sequential basis uh, for, for the cities that are within their, their terrain. So, you know, in my, in my uh, dream of dreams, and since I have folks in the audience here who are from all of, these, all of these reserve banks, I would love to see us have the capacity to conduct these types of surveys in Minneapolis and St. Louis and Philadelphia, in New York City and Chicago. Okay, so those are places that I'd really, really like to see us be able to do this. Uh, I, I should also add, that an additional dimension of this uh, of this of this survey is uh, the fact that we actually have an ethnic break breakdown of whites. So uh, you know, I, I think in the same way in which Asians and blacks are treated as a a homogeneous group, whites are as well. But there's tremendous ethnic variation among folks who are labeled as white. And so as a consequence, we've asked people for ancestry information. And so we can actually look at that variation as well. But what's particularly significant in this, uh, in this table, which gives us uh, median values of net worth for the various groups that we've been able to, uh, to isolate in our study, are two things, that there's a high degree of variation within these aggregate categories. So if you look at the bottom portion of the, uh, of, of the slide, <coughs> where we have a set of communities uh, of folks who would typically be grouped as Asian, we can see that there's a significant amount of variation in Los Angeles across this group based upon national origin. So, for example, uh, the Korean and Vietnamese respondents have considerably lower levels of median net worth than, uh, than the Chinese, Japanese, uh, Filipino, and Asian Indians. Uh, we also find that there's variation across cities. <coughs> so, for example, Koreans in Washington, D.C. have a median net worth of close to $500,000, but in Los Angeles, $23,400. And we can examine these kinds of variations both across cities as well as within these groups by pursuing this type of investigation. Uh, what I will say is that blacks and, uh, and Mexicans in every city that's surveyed have the lowest levels of net worth. And, uh, and, and one of the most uh, striking results is the median level of net worth of, of U.S. blacks in, in, uh, in Boston of eight, eight dollars. Not, not 80, not 800, but eight dollars. Okay. Uh, okay, so the, the final two things I'd like to do <coughs> is suggest some additional routes of research and make mention of, in a very brief way, of some policy options that I think we, we need to put on the table. So the additional research areas, uh, from my perspective, uh, concern the examination of phenotype and economic well-being, uh, developing a more precise analysis of the mechanisms for the intergenerational effects that I mentioned, looking at social mobility in such a way that we examine not only upward mobility but downward mobility and look at the relationship between social mobility and the expansion and contraction of the vaunted middle class. And then finally, uh, I'm in the process of working with Derek Hamilton, Brad Hardy, and Jonathan Murdoch, who is of the Financial Diaries Project, on the development of what we call an economic vulnerability index in which we will be using wealth, income level, income volatility, expense level, and expense volatility as a mechanism for determining how secure, insecure particular households are. With respect to policy, and, and these policies are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they are bold and dramatic departures from the status quo. 
So if we're concerned about black-white inequality in a very specific way, then we need a race-specific policy. And I would propose that we should consider a program of reparations. But if there's a, a reluctance or a hesitance to have a universal program, uh, have a, a race-specific program, there are some universal programs which might accomplish the same, same types of goals. Uh, one of these is a proposal that we refer to as the baby bonds, which is the provision of a federally funded endowment to each newborn infant. Each kid gets a trust fund, and the amount of the trust fund would vary based upon the wealth position of their family. Uh, third is a federal job guarantee, uh, which, is, uh, which is a mechanism for making the unemployment rate absolutely zero. Okay. And then uh, fourth is a universal basic income. And fifth and finally, I'd like to mention public banking. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Okay. So I want to start by saying <clears throat> thank you to the Minneapolis Fed and the Federal Reserve System for including me in this important initiative. So I'm looking forward to working with, with people inside the Fed and people outside the Fed uh, to improve how we can use uh, economic research to have an impact on inequality. So I've decided to focus my comments today on what I gather to be the primary aim of this meeting, which is to figure out on both a conceptual <coughs> and a practical level what role this institute can play in bringing distributional concerns closer to the forefront of macroeconomic research and macroeconomic policy. So with this in mind, and as a macroeconomist, I want to talk a little bit about where I think there are some important gaps in our understanding and where I think macroeconomists have not engaged sufficiently with our micro colleagues and with our colleagues from other disciplines and what, if anything, economists inside the Fed and economists outside the Fed with the Fed's help can do about it. So my starting point is this, and I realize in the context of the <coughs> last presentation it might be a little bit provocative. For almost all of the US population, to a first approximation, economic welfare begins and ends with their labor market. A person's outcome in the labor market, their job, their career, their earnings, is the single most important factor that determines whether or not he or she will be a full participant in America's economic prosperity. If we want to be serious about economic inclusion, then we need to get serious about labor market outcomes. There are many statistics I could quote to make this point. For example, in 2014, 96% of U.S. households had total incomes below $200,000. For this group of households, 80% of their income came directly from wages and salaries. Another 15%, for a total of 95%, comes from annuities and pensions, which are almost entirely the result of labor market involvement over the course of their lifetimes. For the majority of U.S. households, it's labor market income, not financial assets or housing wealth, that determine their economic welfare. The Institute's mission statement talks about structural barriers that limit full participation in economic opportunity and advancement in the United States. And there are, of course, many barriers that one can point to. We heard about some of these yesterday. Race, access to health care, education quality at all levels, housing security, the criminal justice system, social networks. But to a large degree, these are barriers to economic opportunity exactly because they are barriers to the labor market. And as I'll describe, I think the labor market is one area where macroeconomic policies, including conventional and non-conventional monetary policy and financial <coughs> oversight, things that the Fed actually does, can actually play a role. But it's also an area where I think macroeconomists research into the role of policies in this area has been in, in certain important respects lacking. Okay, now, I don't mean to say that macroeconomists have ignored the labor market. They haven't. So there are numerous labor market issues that macroeconomists have indeed studied in depth. We've studied the labor share, the stickiness of wages, the elasticity of aggregate labor <coughs> supply. We heard about the slope of the Phillips curve yesterday, search and matching frictions, <coughs> vacancy posting and the hiring process, patterns of life cycle earnings. But, oh, and of course, economists inside the Fed are monitoring labor market statistics on a daily basis. So, so why do I say that labor market research is lacking among macroeconomists? Well, because to me, there are a set of related issues 
in the labor market that we macroeconomists have paid almost no attention to. And that's the fundamental question of why firms hire workers in the first place. What do they hire them to do? What drives the demand for labor? And how is the type and distribution of labor demand affected by monetary and fiscal policies? If we want to use macro policies to influence economic inclusion, then we first need to understand how macro policies affect labor demand. And I claim that right now we actually know very little about this. So let me tell you how labor demand works in almost every macroeconomic model that I've seen, particularly those macroeconomic models that have a role for fiscal, monetary, and financial factors. You want to produce more goods, you hire more labor. More goods, more workers. In these models, labor demand goes up because we want to or become able to consume more goods and services or because people just become better at making stuff. Hire more labor, produce more goods and services. Demand more goods and services, we'll hire more labor. Now, maybe that's a good simplification for assembly line workers in manufacturing. Maybe it's also a good simplification for hairdressers. But for many workers and many firms, in today's economy, the mapping between labor and output and labor and the profits of firms is much, much, much more complex. Now, most people, not all, but most, get their labor income by working at firms. And we've heard very little about firms over the course of this meeting so far. Labor, in other words, people, do many different things in the generation of profits for firms. Sure, some people make goods and services which are then sold by their firms, but many people are not directly involved in producing stuff, be it goods or services. They market things, they sell things, they buy things that the firm needs to produce that it then goes on to sell. They design things, they comply with regulations, they maintain systems or maintain machines or maintain the social infrastructure within, within their firms creating intangible capital. Some of them sit around and figure out better ways to do all these things. Firms hire workers to do many different types of activities. And recognizing this is important for economic inclusion because these different activities, these different tasks, they tend to be systematically performed by very different types of people. People from different social backgrounds, with different levels of education, and with very, very different levels of income. Now, why does this matter for macroeconomists? Well, because each of these activities, and hence the demand for different types of workers, is influenced by macroeconomic conditions and macroeconomic policies in different ways. For example, some types of labor are variable in nature. They constitute marginal costs for firms, like in the traditional macro models that I alluded to. But some types of labor are overhead in nature. They constitute more like fixed costs. Firms need some lawyers or accountants or HR managers, regardless of how many things they sell in a particular week or quarter. And others are somewhere in between, like software engineers, who produce an essentially zero marginal cost product. It doesn't require any more labor to produce any more iPhone apps. But iPhone developers must be continually improving their products if they do want to stay in business. Now, for some of these tasks and some types of these workers, labor demand can adjust quickly and respond to short-term changes in macro conditions, like people who lay bricks or sell home insurance. For other tasks and other type of workers, it takes much more time for them to become productive and labor demand depends on long-term forecasts of macro conditions, not short-term fluctuations, like people who supervise teams of scientists. Demand for labor to do some of these tasks in some industries is sensitive to financial conditions like spreads on corporate debt and short-term financing constraints. But demand for other types of labor is not. Now, it may sound like this is yet another long list of examples of heterogeneity and real world complexities that by definition, it's macroeconomists job, my job to simplify away. But the point is that if the goal is economic inclusion, then it matters what types of labor and what types of tasks we affect when we implement macro policies. And it matters what types of skills and what types of education we promote when we implement human capital policies. And to understand 
how to do this, we have to get under the hood of labour demand inside firms. We need to figure out what is the distribution of tasks and skills, and it is a distribution because the in the future not everyone can be a software engineer or a nurse, that will become the foundation of an inclusive labour market for the next generation. Macroeconomists have thought very hard about how to stimulate demand for goods and services, particularly in the wake of the 2008 recession. But we did this taking for granted that that increase in demand for labour would lead to increases in economic welfare for all workers. It did not. We have not thought hard enough about how to stimulate demand for labour in a way that fosters inclusive labour market outcomes. And on this point, I thought yesterday's discussion by Janet Curry and Ed Lazier on training versus retraining was particularly on point. A big part of what we need to do is to take more seriously the task skill nexus that David Order and his co-authors have been pushing and integrate those ideas into the study of monetary and fiscal policy. I'll say more about that in a moment. But, but that's only part of it. There are also labor, other labor market issues, in addition to labor demand, that macroeconomists don't nearly think hard enough. I don't have time to discuss them, but let me mention three. First, that most people work in teams and labor market success requires being adept at teamwork, just like getting a job depends on social networks. Second, that there is both horizontal as well as vertical differentiation in skills and developing and fostering those skills starts very early. Janet Curry said yesterday that if we understand what is happening with children, then we will understand what's happening with adults 30 or 40 years from now. This sentiment is echoed in some recent work that I've done with Fadi Guvenen, where we compare life cycle earnings profiles of different cohorts using Social Security Administration data. We found that almost all of the stagnation in labour incomes in the bottom parts of the distribution that we've seen for recent cohorts and the associated rise in lifetime inequality for these lifetime income inequality for these cohorts can actually be attributed to a stagnation of incomes and increases in income inequality in the incomes of young people around the time of entry to the labour market. Where people start out in the labour market is more important than ever and more work needs to be done on labour demand specifically for young people. Third, that aggregate, aggregate labour market health is a lot more than employment rates and wage rates. Why? Because for many people their job is a lot more than an employer and a wage. It's a defining feature of their life. And for many people, particularly those high up the income distribution, People like us, they actually enjoy their jobs. I do. Labor enters the utility function for me with the completely the wrong sign. <laughs> Enjoying, or at least not hating, what you do all day is another part of inequality that we don't pay enough attention to. I've been working with Sam Schulhofer World to measure some of these long run changes and cross-sectional inequality in these non-pecuniary features of work. We need to do more of that. But the overarching point that I want to make today is that the next generation of macro models needs to take the subtleties of labour demand much more seriously. So what concretely can the Fed and this institute do about it? Data and models. First, the first thing they can do is help us to get better data. There are very few data sources, especially in the United States, where we can observe at a sufficient <laughs> level of detail what workers do inside firms, how they spend their days, why the firm needs them, how they add value to the firm that they work for, and effectively how they are, and ultimately how they are adding value to the economy. The best we have is broad occupation categories inside firms, and as we heard yesterday, even that's hard to come by. Linking this information to worker histories would be even better, but that's probably too much to ask. <laughs> We need to be able to go under the hood of firms to measure what different workers at different income levels actually do and when and why firms want to employ more or fewer of them. That way we can begin to understand in a systematic and quantitative way the answer to the question that Neil posed yesterday about the conversations he's had with local business owners. I wish that we could turn Neil's conversations into systematic, da systematic data about the labour needs of different types of firms. 
When we have better data on how and why different workers add value to firms, then we can start to explore how that value changes when monetary or fiscal conditions change, or when financial and banking conditions change. The importance of financial and banking conditions has been repeated ad nauseum since the 2008 financial crisis. But we have no direct evidence on how access to liquidity affects demand for different types of tasks and hence different types of workers. Stabilization policy, Ed Lazier told us yesterday, is an area where the Fed's mandate allows it to directly influence inequality because of the 2x rule that we heard about. But the only way we're going to understand why it's x and then why it's 2x is to collect data that links the firm and macro conditions to a detailed picture of its labor force. And for no workers is this more true than the ones who are on the edges of economic inclusion. The same goes for economic growth and human capital policy. We simply cannot make informed policy decisions about how to train and educate the next generation without good data and a close analysis of the labor needs of the firm, firms that they will ultimately work for, their future employers. The second thing that the Fed can do is to promote and encourage the use and development of better models. And on this front, I think there's been exciting progress and I expect slash hope that the Fed system will become ground zero as these efforts continue. We've recently seen an explosion of proper quantitative macro models that do take heterogeneity and distributional concerns seriously, while maintaining a role for monetary and financial factors. These so-called Hank models, it stands for heterogeneous agent New Keynesian models, they still have some way to go. They're far, far from perfect. But I think it's a great platform for starting to address distributional issues in areas where, until recently, the focus has been entirely on aggregate outcomes. We need to continue and to improve this line of work. But I realize that's not easy. It's hard. And in particular, the computational challenges that arise when the object of macroeconomic interest is an entire distribution, as it should be. These computational challenges are formidable. So that's why I've been working with a team of co-authors to develop an easy to use computational toolbox for solving a large class of macro models with heterogeneity. We figured that the best way to get people to tackle difficult problems is to make it easier for them. So the toolbox is still in its early stages, but an alpha version is ready and freely available online. And we hope it will find its way into the Fed and that the Institute can help by encouraging young researchers inside the Fed to use these tools and to support their development. But with regards to the labor demand questions that I've been talking about, there is still a huge amount of work to be done. Put simply, heterogeneous agent models, including Hank models, need richer theories of labor demand. It's amazing. The, the benchmark models that we use to study distributional issues in macroeconomics are models in which consumption and wealth inequality are endogenous, but in which labor inequality is almost always either fixed or involves exogenously. That needs to change. We need to take what we learn from looking more closely at how demand for different skills and different tasks responds to aggregate conditions, and we need to use it to improve our models. It's time to integrate task-based models of labor demand into heterogeneous agent macro, or translated into nerdy mathematical language for those who appreciate it, optimal transport theory, which we use to study the assignment of skills to tasks, needs to meet mean field games, which we use to study how the distribution of those skills influences and is influenced by the distribution of demand for tasks. Even if it achieves nothing else, to me, this inclusive growth initiative will be successful if it mobilizes the huge army of Fed researchers to focus even more than they currently do on whole distributions as the variable of macroeconomic interest rather than just aggregates. And I think a richer <coughs> understanding of the labor market and labor demand in particular will hopefully play a bigger role in that agenda. All right. Well, again, it's uh, very good to be here. And uh, it's an exciting, I think, a potentially valuable initiative that's been uh, launched. I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, 
I'm going to make some remarks here. I'm going to uh, read uh, a text. Um, I'm not actually reporting on research. I am uh, going to share with you some excerpts from my uh, memoir in progress. Uh, so I'm going to have to ask you to uh, forgive what may be, uh, or what at least may seem to be, an overly personalistic account. Um, I think by the time I get to the end, you'll see that it is a intervention in the conversation that will stimulate some discussion. All right, so as a prologue, I ask you to consider the following imaginary dialogue between two African-American social scientists. One, a mathematically oriented economist like myself, and the other, an ethnographically oriented sociologist, like some of those people we heard from yesterday, uh, although this one has radical political leanings. So here's the economist chanting, but otherwise sitting very still. Relations before transactions. Relations before transactions. Relations before transactions. The sociologist enters with a start, alarmed. What's wrong, my friend? Why are you saying that? Are you the culprit who pilfered my copy of Bordeaux last week? The economist, no, I'm not. And who's Bordeaux anyway? One of those airy French sociologists you're always fawning over, I'll bet. It's my mantra. I'm meditating. It's very calming. You ought to try it sometime. The sociologist ignores the dig and says, I meditate all the time, man. I'm the one who belongs to a profession fraught with anxiety, remember? But what's your excuse? And the economist allows, well, I've been having a recurrent nightmare lately, and I wanted to stop. My shriek thinks that meditation could help. Who's your shrink? Oh, this brother who was my roommate at Swarthmore. Brilliant dude. Works a lot with gunshot victims, inner city types involved in guns and the gang tr uh, uh, drugs and the drug trade and so on. He thinks they're making passive suicide attempts. He writes books about self-loathing, helplessness, fear falling into an existential abyss. He cites Nietzsche and Freud and Decide. Strange guy, but brilliant. He gave me the mantra, promised it would help, said I should repeat it slowly while sitting very still and taking deep breaths. The sociologist. Perhaps, but remember what I told you about those pizzas, not such a good, diet, good idea after midnight. <laughs> and did you say decide? Anyway, tell me, what's the dream? The economist, oh, it's awful. I'm back in grad school. I'm sitting in my usual place right in the front of the class. The professor has posed what he says is an important question. He invited one of us to the board to work out an answer. I get there first and proceed to fill the board with equations. Finally, I arrive at what must be the solution. My derivation is far too elegant not to be true. I turn to explain myself to the rest of the class, and just then, I realize that I've forgotten the original question. I rack my very large brain, but for the life of me, I can't recall it. The class begins to snicker. They're a ruthless bunch when they smell blood. The guffaws and catcalls grow louder. It's humiliating, just humiliating, and the economist trembling returns. The sociologist trying to comfort his friend, yeah, I can see that it's got to be tough being the smartest person in the room, but without a clue as to what's the point. You ought to stick with this shrink throw. Dreams can be very revealing, you know. But I'm not sure I get the mantra. And what was the professor's question anyway? <laughs> the economist. He had asked us to explain how durable racial inequality in the United States can be squared with the premises of modern economic theory without making any assumptions of innate racial inf inferiority and without postulating any unexplained preferences for own group association. The sociologist, that's a damned good question and a tough one too. You're telling me you ran to the board to take that one on? Brave man. The economist, well, to be honest with you, in the dream, I always start up to the board before he finishes posing the question. Happens the same way every time. I can't help myself. And the trembling returns. The sociologist, in a bright tone, hoping to shift to a happier subject. So what was your elegant solution? The economist, oh, I'd love to tell you, but it's hopeless. You'd never understand the mathematics. At that, the sociologist takes offense and storms off angrily with the economist yelling after him. Besides, I'm not sure I believe it anymore myself. Anyway, my shrink gave me this mantra, and it seems to be helping. And he returns to his chanting, relations before transactions, relations before transactions. And so ends the dialogue. Whimsical, I know, but not without its point. What is the meaning of this uh, literary diversion, you will ask? Well, it is self-referential, of course. 
For over these last 40 years, since my days as a graduate student back at MIT in the 1970s, I've expended considerable effort trying to explain to myself and to the world why the subordinate status of African Americans persists in the United States. Some of this thinking was summed up in my monograph, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, which Harvard University Press published some years ago. The book sketched a theory of race applicable to the social and historical circumstances of the United States, speculating on why racial inequalities persist. It advanced a conceptual framework for thinking about social justice and matters of race. It was one part social science, one part social criticism, and one part social philosophy, themes that were pursued in successive chapters entitled Racial Stereotypes, Racial Stigma, and Racial Justice, deriving from a synonymous series of lectures that I had given at the Du Bois Institute. So I want to fix ideas here a little bit by briefly reviewing some of those arguments. A theoretical discussion of this kind properly starts with an account of the phenomenon of race itself. Why do people take note of and assign significance to the skin color, hair texture, bone structure of other human beings? How have superficial markings on human bodies taken on social significance to the extent that people routinely partition the field of human subjects whom they encounter into groups with this sorting convention based on these subjects possessing some observable bodily marks. This is a universal feature of human societies, but why should this be so? I proposed, acknowledging in advance that there was no great originality in this, to conceive of race as a social construct, a conventional, not a natural category. For me, the term race refers to indelible, inheritable marks on human bodies of no intrinsic significance in themselves, which nevertheless have through time been invested with social expectations that are more or less reasonable and social meanings that are more or less durable. A particular interest to me is the possibility that powerful and derogatory social meanings can even be internalized by persons identifying with a stigmatized racial group, even people like me, who might hope to study such matters more or less scientifically. How does one achieve a the objective observer stance while enmeshed in the tangled web of identities, fealties, and conflicting narratives, which is the nature of racial discourse in America. Note, we are dealing here with two processes, categorization and signification. Categorization involves sorting people into cognitively manageable subsets on the basis of bodily marks while differentiating one's dealings with such persons accordingly. Signification is an interpretive act that associates certain connotations or social meanings with those categories. Both informational and symbolic issues are at play, or as I like to put it when speaking of race, what we're really talking about is embodied social signification. A self-conscious awareness that the marks on one's bodies, the marks one bears on one's body convey profound significations to those one encounters in society can be an impediment to one's psychological health, particularly in a country like mine, where because of the need to justify chattel slavery in a nation which self-consciously defined itself as the land of the free, the mark of blackness has been infused with long enduring derogatory significations. Fundamental to my approach in that book and sense was the distinction that I drew between racial discrimination and racial stigma. Discrimination is about how people are treated and stigma is about how they are perceived. I argued that what I called reward bias was a less significant barrier to the full participation of African Americans in US society than was what I called development bias. Reward bias pointed to the differential treatment of persons based upon race in formal transactions, thereby limiting the rewards that blacks might receive for a given set of skills and talents that they present to the market. By contrast, development bias referred to impediments that block access of persons in a subordinate racial group to resources that are essential to develop skill and to refine talent. So reward bias rests on a foundation of racially discriminatory transactions, whereas development bias, in my mind, is rooted in racially stigmatized social relations, since many resources that foster human development only become available to persons as the byproduct of informal race-influenced social relations. I stress that neither reward nor development bias constitute a post-racial view of the structure of opportunity in the country. Obviously, these two kinds of bias are not mutually exclusive. Skill acquisition can be blocked by discriminatory transactions, and a regime of market discrimination that is under pressure from economic competition may require for its maintenance employing the instruments of informal social control. Plenty of examples from American history in the 20th century attest to both. 
Still, the distinction I think is useful for, whereas the moral problem presented by reward bias is straightforward and calls for an uncontroversial remedy via laws against discrimination, development bias seems to present a subtler, more insidious moral problem and may be difficult to remedy in any manner that is likely to garner majoritarian support. Uh -huh. This difficulty has both a cognitive and an ethical dimension. From a cognitive point of view, many observers may find it difficult to distinguish between blocked developmental opportunities and limited inherent capacities or distorted values when seeking to understand a group's poor social performance. <clears throat> In terms of ethics, many citizens who find transactional discrimination associated with reward bias to be noxious may be less offended by the often covert and subconscious relational discrimination that underlies development bias. That is, they may object, say, when a white police officer treats a black youth unfairly, but they will say nothing at all when white families move away from a racially integrated residential community because of their fear of the threat that they perceive from so-called black crime. So now, perhaps you can see what I'm after with that mantra, relations before transactions. I'm pointing toward the idea that the subordinate status of African Americans in the economy derives from our stigmatized status in the society and not the other way around. Stigma inhibits blacks' access to those networks of social affiliation where developmental resources are most readily appropriated. Today's problem, I'm conjecturing, is not so much a race influence market place or administrative state refusing to reward black talent or to accord blacks an equal citizenship, as had been the case in decades past. Rather, today's problem, I wish to claim, is mainly a race-tinged psychology of perception and evaluation that at some level withholds from blacks the presumption of an equal human worth. Of course, again, I stress these are not mutually exclusive ways of thinking. A racial group's stigmatized status in the social imagination and in its own self-understanding, may be reinforced, justified, and socially reproduced as a result of that group's subordinate position in the economic order, thus creating a vicious circle. Here we have a world where notions of racial dignity, racial inequality, racial subordination, racial inferiority, racial honor and pride and shame resonate powerfully, such has been my world for those very notions about honor and dignity and equality and pride and shame have been central to my own biography. Permit me to explain. There are, broadly speaking, two distinct narratives available when scholars and political actors discuss the persistent subordinate economic position of African Americans, what I'll call the bias narrative and the development narrative. The first refers, as you could imagine, based on what I've already said, to the racially discriminatory treatment of blacks, whereas the second refers to the relative lack of investments in those activities that enhance the productivity of black Americans. Again, I have to say these are not mutually exclusive, and I don't suggest it must be one, all, all one or the other. Presently, however, the bias narrative reigns supreme, and as it has done for the past 50 years. I am of the view that this way of framing the problem is an anachronism a holdover from mid 20th century that no longer adequately captures the present day realities for black people, particularly those who are the most severely disadvantaged. But the plain fact of the matter is that many public policies and much public rhetoric insist on framing the problem of persistent racial inequality and in prescribing remedies for it as if that outdated mid 20th century bias narrative adequately captured the main issues. And I believe this is a serious error. For in many areas of our public life, from the schools to the workplace to the criminal justice system, the policies most likely, in my view, to be effective in closing gaps should be focused on enhancing the development of the human potential of black people and not on preventing us from being the victims of anti-black discrimination. Again, I do not maintain that these are mutually exclusive or that bias does not exist or that such bias as does exist ought not to be combated. I merely claim and I claim this in the strongest possible terms, that it matters a great deal which of these narratives is emphasized and when. This choice of narrative is enormously important. The real lives of millions of people hang in the balance. Bad ideas have awful consequences. To tell our people, and this is a personal statement, forgive me, to tell our people that all of their woes stem from a failure of whites to treat us equally, all the while avoiding taking up the challenge um, as Sandra Samuels has done brilliantly, 
Failing to take up the challenge of making ourselves more effective, productive, and virtuous members of society is to take the easy path and to offer a false sense of power. It is, in my view, my view, a tragic misleading of our people. I believe that we Americans, black, white, and otherwise, need a new narrative which, while um, remaining alert to and mindful of the problem of racially discriminatory treatment, tones down the white supremacy has done us wrong mantra and makes more room for recognition of and response to the problems of inadequate human development in the African-American population. This new way of thinking and talking would, amongst other things, emphasize the responsibility which we African-Americans ourselves have within our own families and communities to effectively and wholeheartedly address these developmental roadblocks. So there, I've said it. Having thrown down that gauntlet, allow me to shift gears a bit, and with your indulgence, uh, to wax autobiographical. Um, my story begins some 42 years ago, but I don't have time here to tell that whole story, so let me, uh, as I used to say when I was a kid reading racy novels, let me cut to the good part. Um, let me close with a personal recollection and confession about the day I made Mrs. Coretta Scott King, the late Mrs. R Coretta Scott King, weep. The year was 1984, and the place was a meeting of black leaders in Washington, DC. This consortium of officials from major organizations would periodically come together to consider matters of mutual interest. I was there because a graduate school mentor of mine, a great woman named Phyllis Ann Wallace, had so arranged. Phyllis was a professor at MIT Sloan School of Economics and an African American, one of the very few black economists teaching at a top level in academia at that time. She knew of the errant thoughts that I had been putting out in some essays that I had been writing in the early 80s, my neoconservative phase. Some people think I never left it, but in any case, <laughs> Phyllis was aware of what I had been up to. Uh, and. Um, uh, was alarmed by some of the criticisms of the civil rights program of that day, which I was issuing in public. I had shown her an earlier draft of a piece that was to appear later that year in the New Republic magazine under the title, A New American Dilemma. And so Phyllis, being alarmed with this draft, basically said to me that it'd be great if I sat down with some of our leaders, share my concerns with them, and listen to theirs in return. I was pretty good at the first part, not so good at the second. Uh, that I could have some dialogue with people, she thought. And so she added me to the agenda of this meeting of the Civil Rights Coalition, and I showed up and gave my spiel. It was a hot summer day in 1984, but I was sweating more heavily than the heat required. I was afraid how people might react to what I knew that I had to say. We met at the Urban Institute in a not especially distinct gray stone office building in Northwest Washington, D.C., in a seminar-type room without a podium, just a long table with chairs all around it. There was some additional seating away from the table along the room's wall. Maybe a dozen people, the principals, were seated at the table, and a few more were scattered in the periphery. And I just stood at my seat to speak. I spoke without notes. I had four or five points that I wanted to make. My draft article had circulated, so I just emphasized my main points. They were attentive, and they didn't show the impatience that they must have felt. Perhaps they were just a bit patronizing. Here I was at that time, a 35-year-old professor at Harvard University, proposing in this article that I was going to put out in Martin Peretz's New Republic magazine, not necessarily the most popular venue with many left liberal African Americans. Uh, at that time, I was writing high. I was the first black to, given, to be given tenure in economics at Harvard. Um, and these people saw my achievement as the fruit of the civil rights struggle, and so there was a sense of despair, I think, from some of these leaders to be confronted by someone like me, a product of their efforts who had gone so far off the rails. But they were polite, even cordial, and they had numerous questions at the end. I was nervous, but also excited, in a way maybe even a bit arrogantly assertive, if you can believe that, with an edge in my voice, with the words coming too quickly, with my emotion, my anger showing through as I spoke. I knew that I was, what I was saying would fly in the face of what they believed, and still I wanted to emphasize that I thought that they were off track, that I wasn't hesitant to say so, to shout it out for the whole world to hear. I wasn't hiding from that or apologizing for it. On that particular day, I was pretty sure that I was right about what I was saying to them, and I still am. 
Looking around the room, I saw some familiar faces. Benjamin Hooks of the NAACP, John Jacobs of the Urban League, Eddie Williams of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, the historian Roger Wilkins, uh, the politician Julian Bond, Coretta Scott King of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but more importantly, of course, representing Dr. King's legacy. There were others. Looking out in their faces, people who might have been seeing on the evening news, our leaders, I felt proud to be there. Clearly, this was a key moment in my career. Important people wanted to hear from me. So yes, I felt a certain pride and a certain trepidation. Might they be angered by what I had to say? Even so, truth be told, I was more than a little bit titillated by that prospect because from my perspective, I was the town crier. I was the fellow declaring the emperor has no clothes. I was bringing the truth to light. I was certain that I had seen something important which others had overlooked, or if they had seen it, they lacked the courage to say so. And so I spoke. I'd given the same talk on more than one prior occasion. We stood there in the summer of 1984. President Ronald Reagan was completing his first term, and he was destined to be reelected in a landslide later that year. We could all see this coming. Two decades had passed since the heyday of the civil rights achievements of the 1960s. It was time to take stock. Where have we blacks gotten ourselves to? <clears throat> High up in the speech, throwing down the gauntlet yet again, that's my role in life, it would appear, came my signature declaration, the civil rights movement is over. I asserted that problems of the lower classes of African American society plagued by poverty and joblessness were at the end of the day not remediable by the means which had been so effective in the 1960s of protest and petitioning for fair treatment. What we now face, I suggested, was a new American dilemma. The formulation I ultimately settled on contrasted an enemy without white racism with an enemy within black society. Sure, I allowed that racism continued to hinder black people, but I thought it was much abated and constrained by civil rights legislation. By contrast, citing a long list of statistics, I characterized what I was calling the enemy within black communities, an enemy limiting our capacity to seize upon such opportunity as was now open to us. Single parent families, early unwed pregnancy, criminalized youth, low academic achievement, absence from the labor force, and so on. This litany was about what I was willingly calling social pathology in the so-called black underclass, okay? It was 30 years ago, you had to be there. Nobody, <laughs> nobody talks like that anymore. Uh, but so it was. Um, I concluded that this social pathology needed to be addressed and crucially that the methods of yesteryear's civil rights protests would not be an effective means of doing so. Then a remarkable thing happened. Coretta Scott King started weeping just as I was ending my talk. This was shocking and alarming to me. The tears welled up in her eyes and rolled down her cheeks. Some others among the assembled had direct questions. Well, Professor Lowry, don't you think some of these so-called pathologies, what you're calling pathologies, that is, are themselves the consequence of our people having been denied equal rights and victimized by discrimination? Professor Lowry, can you not see that the things that you're saying here are precisely what conservative Republicans can be heard to say in their derogatory and stereotypic renderings about African-American life? Professor Lowry, don't you realize it's more complicated than that? But it was Coretta King's extraordinary silent commentary registered with uh, her simple tears that had the greatest impact on me. Think about it. Here was the widow of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., a woman who more than any other single person embodied the black freedom struggle. No, she was not a thought leader or a political actor in any meaningful sense, not a strategist, not an intellectual, but still she was an enormous figure. And so, though I didn't take her response to what I had to say as probative at a cognitive level, didn't conclude that, well, if she thinks this, maybe I'm wrong, I had better go back to the drawing board, didn't see her as a serious public intellectual, still, I surely took her seriously as Dr. King's widow, and this, I thought, is an iconic person who represents something sacred in a civic sense. Her husband, while serving his people in his country, had been murdered at the age of 39, only a few years older than was I at that moment. Here sits his widow. I should, and I did, feel honored to be in her presence. And by the way, her seat at the table was just next to mine. I had only to look down into her face to see those tears. And so I stood there by my seat, surveying a table of maybe 10 people. Just to my left, as it happened, was Mrs. King. As I wound up my argument to the effect that the civil rights movement was off track, that the protest era was basically over, that the primary obstacles to the attainment of equality for African Americans were internal barriers, having to do with our own behavior, how we needed uh, 
how we organized our communities, how we were raising our children and so forth, uh, and that this desperately needed saying at precisely that moment when the conservative Ronald Reagan saw the second term as president of the United States, I turned to see this woman, this iconic figure, this symbol of civil rights martyrdom weeping. She offered no argument. She didn't specify what I had said that was wrong. Uh, this alarmed me, of course, but it also befuddled me, weeping about what I wondered at the time. What in the argument I had just offered could have brought her to tears? Frankly, it did not occur to me at that moment to think, oh my God, man, you've made that woman cry. You had better reflect a bit on what you're doing and what you're saying, not in the interest of being right or wrong about anything in particular, but to better understand the role that you're speaking in this way plays within some larger social drama. This is the difference between being right about the movement and being helpful to it. In those years, I didn't even uh, begin to consider which of these alternatives might be more important to me. I had few second thoughts and even less self-awareness at the time, but the benefit now, with the benefit now more than 30 years hindsight, um, I can see that uh, pretty clearly, but at the time it didn't occur to me. And then I have here an excerpt from that essay in 1984, which I'm not going to read but which went over in some detail statistics about family structure, about uh, rates of incarceration, about low academic performance, and so on and so forth. Um, what I can see now, and I'll conclude, but was blind to then, is that while all that I had said there was undoubtedly true at the time, and similar retiny of, uh, litany of statistics could be recited about our contemporary time, uh, those statistics could have been and can be as easily read as an indictment of American society rather than of black society. That is, the most fundamental questions are ones of interpretation, not of description, of values and not merely of facts, of political and not just personal or social morality. So anyway, it seems to me today, as I survey the social landscape of my country, which continues to be despoiled by stubbornly persistent racial subordination. But then, why could I not see this much in 1984? Why did I construe the sorry state of black social life in terms of the failings of black society and not American society? Why do I sometimes think so still? Today, reflecting on that essay from the mid-1980s, I ask myself, what was I really feeling when I wrote it? I was angry, for one. I was also ashamed, and I was afraid. I was angry at what I took to be the dishonesty of the discourse from these leaders, to be sure, but also in the media and in liberal commentary, because I didn't think I was saying anything when citing the social conditions of lower class African American communities that was not commonly known to everyone concerned with these issues. And yet I felt that there was a conspiracy of silence about it. I knew that conspiracy didn't extend to the pews of a black church where a pastor might sermonize lamenting the nature of life on the streets of his city. Many a sermon decrying the ill effects of that uh, from loose living were, in fact, being preached to African Americans. But on the talk show circuit, in the lecture halls, at the podiums, where political speeches were given and in the demands and representation of black leaders, it seemed to me that no honest assessment of these conditions was being made, except when it might serve to indict white society for what had gone so terribly wrong. I felt that these conditions also constituted an indictment of ourselves as African Americans about how too many of us were living. This angered me. But I must also admit, in 1984, I felt ashamed at some level for my people. I can see now that I was trumpeting how bad things were in part as an antidote to the feeling that, oh my God, what do most people really think of us, and therefore, in some way, of me, when gazing upon the disorder that I am describing here? Well, at least I'm ready to call a spade a spade, I could tell myself. I'm telling it like it is, I could tell myself. At least I have the courage to look reality in the face without flinching, I could tell myself. In retrospect, I can see that my blustering public indictments were my way of compensating for, in part, the shame I felt for my community, for my people, and at some level for myself, due to being associated with, embedded in, possessed by so-called black social pathology. Moreover, I was feeling a bit of fear. Where would the future take us, I wondered. What would happen to these communities like the ones that I was raised in on Chicago's South Side? What would become of the people living in those housing projects, which I knew quite well? And what would become of the kids dependent upon schools where they weren't learning how to read or do algebra? 
What would the future bring? I feared that if we didn't get it right, we would find ourselves dealing with these same issues two or three generations down the line. And so it would appear we have. It's enough to make a grown man cry. Thank you. Switcher. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Kashkari and the Fed for inviting me. I'm very grateful to be here. It's a very important issue, I think, uh, that we need to discuss in the Twin Cities. As Mr. Kashkari was saying, we have some of the largest, if not the largest, disp disparities between whites and African Americans in the country in education, employment, in wealth, in mortgage lending. Almost across the field, from beginning to ending, ending in incarceration, we have one of the largest disparities in, in incarceration. And this is a very sad story for a place like this to be that, in that way. And there, isn't, uh, there hasn't been a good explanation. I've been trying to study this. I'm a lawyer. That's another reason I'm grateful to be here. I don't have a PhD, so I understand that this is a great compliment to uh, be invited to such a conference. But uh, I, studying this disparity, looking back in history, it really began to appear about 10 or 12 years ago when we started to see these really striking disparities report after report. In the 1970s, uh, the disparities between whites and blacks here were less than average. In fact, uh, if you re read the court files of a case called Booker versus uh, Minneapolis School District, you saw disparities shrinking year after year in the Minneapolis School District every year during the 1960s and 70s making progress. Why did this happen? I think this is a really good question, and I'm really grateful that someone has amassed this kind of brain power and this kind of resources to think about this. We need to know why this has happened. I'm a lawyer, and I'm going to talk about laws, and I'm going to talk about some suspicions that I have about what happened. Uh, I'm also going to talk about two programs, two choice-based programs, charter schools and uh, open enrollment programs, also the, uh, the uh, federal low-income housing tax credit that's been pretty outside of the radar of civil rights regulation in the country, how these have cooperated with a very important change in legal regime. The Twin Cities in the 1960s and 70s was a very pro-racial integration place, probably the most in the country. It was illegal. De facto, segregation was illegal under Minnesota law until 1999. Not many places said this. Uh, Minnesota took its authority from a case called Swan versus Charlotte Becklenburg, and in that case, Justice Berger, a Minnesotan writing for the court, said that local school districts should be able to do whatever they want to to integrate schools. This is a compelling governmental interest, and that uh, elected officials, free from court order, should be able to do whatever they want to. Now, this the Swan decision came into doubt in the uh, after the, a case called Bakke, which began to place limits on what what people would call positive discrimination, affirmative action. And people began to say, is school, is school desegregation without proof of racial intent, is that affirmative action? Uh, some people said yes, some people said no. And that, quite, that case, it wasn't really finally resolved by the Supreme Court until 2007 when Justice Kennedy said no, school desegregation is a compelling governmental interest and it's a good thing. We shouldn't have quotas, we shouldn't have, make personal decisions for, uh, to admit kids into selective school programs solely on the basis of race, but we can use race as one of many alternatives. And if school districts want to use boundaries or, or transfer policies or pro-integrative uh, pro incentives, this is fine. But in the 1990s, there was a case called Hopwood that came down in the Fifth Circuit. And Hopwood said in, in the Fifth Circuit that affirmative action was illegal in higher education. And based on that case, the state of Minnesota decided that its school desegregation programs, the pro-integrative programs, were suspect constitutionally. Uh, that there wasn't, Minnesota, the Attorney General of Minnesota in 1999 declared in an opinion there is no necessarily compelling interest in racial integration. And if you're a constitutional law scholar, that's an important distinction. If you have a compelling interest, which Justice Kennedy has said there is in integration, you can do most anything you want as long as it's narrowly tailored and uh, is following a compelling governmental interest. When you say something isn't a compelling governmental interest, if you use race in any classification, it becomes presumptively illegal. And in effect, Minnesota made this change in the late 1990s, and we became a lot more segregated. And I'm going to show some maps uh, kind of showing this pattern. And I, I think this is related to these disparities. Now, I hope I know how to do this. Oops, I think I just turned it off. Now, how do you? OK, there we go. Now, this is a map of the, of the Twin Cities, and it's a little bit hard to see, probably. Each of those squares is an elementary school. And uh, the two central cities in the Minneapolis, the two rectangles, Minneapolis is the tall rectangle, St. Paul is the uh, horizontal one. The maps will become, the first couple are hard to see, the rest will be much clearer. 
But every one of those elementary schools in 2011 that's red is more than 75% uh, non-white. The orange ones are 50 to 70, the yellow are, are, the medium orange are 35 to 50, light blue are 22 to 35, medium blue 11 to 22, and dark blue are uh, less than 1% to 11%. In my maps, red is always going to be the highest minority and blue is always going to be the whitest or wealthiest. It's a common color scheme. So when you're looking at wealth or whiteness, you'll see blue. When you're looking at poverty or segregation, you'll see red. And you can see by 2011, most of the schools in the central cities were more than 73% non-white and poor. Now, we, our racial counterparts in the United States are Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. They have the same percentage of black and Latino people that we do. We have about 100 schools that are more than 75% non-white and poor. Portland has two. Seattle, which has a million more people, has about 20. So we have about four times as many as they do. And in 1991, we didn't have a single segregated school. Uh, in the days when we had very powerful racial integration, there wasn't a single racially segregated school in, in the entire metropolitan area. And people used to say, this isn't really part of the United States. It must be part of Canada or Sweden or something. But now we, have, we look a lot more like the rest of the United States. And you can see those, uh, those, those poor schools and clustered in the city and many of the first ring suburbs. Uh, this is a map that shows the percentage of kids on free lunch, poor kids, kids that qualify for free or reduced cost lunch. And in Minnesota and in the United States, if you're black or Latino and poor, three quarters of black and Latino poor children go to schools that are more than 70% poor. If you're white and poor in this metropolitan area, the rest of the country, if you're white and poor, 75% of white students go to schools that have majority middle class enrollment. So race and poverty really link tightly together uh, in the Twin Cities and most of the Midwest and Northeast. And when you go to a high poverty school, there's very powerful evidence that a high poverty school uh, decreases the likelihood you're going to graduate, no matter who your parents are. A high poverty school decreases the connections you have to higher education or college. It has very strong connections over the life course with earnings and benefits. Uh, kids in high poverty schools create, have great disadvantages, and that's true whether they are the all black schools in Minneapolis or the all white poor uh, schools in Appalachia. So you can see the tight map. This almost, the poverty map almost looks like, like the race map. Here's a percentage change, and one of the things that we're finding is the most rapidly changing school districts aren't in the central cities, but are in the suburbs. And our work uh, suggests that the most racially integrated parts of America now are the first and second ring suburbs, where the achievement gap between blacks and whites is much, much smaller than it is in, uh, between central cities and suburbs. Or in many, I'm going to talk about the Minneapolis school district, where the achievement gap between whites and blacks is really striking. But big changes in the suburbs. Also big changes in poverty in the suburbs. Now here's dropout rates, and dropout rates are highly correlated to poverty, and, which is highly correlated uh, to race. And if you are in a very, very high poverty school, the probability of dropping out doubles uh, or even more. There's a man named Robert Balfonts at the University of Rochester that calls highly segregated high schools dropout factories. Uh, work by uh, uh, scholars, uh, Lafrum and others are beginning to say segregated high schools are one of the most powerful predictors uh, uh, that people will end up in the criminal justice system. And you can certainly see the dropout rates in the uh, high poverty, high segregation high schools in the cities and in the entering suburbs, much higher than they are in the more affluent suburbs. This is another way to look at dropouts, four-year graduation rate. Uh, I'm going to uh, this, these are uh, completion. These are all various measures of dropping out. I'm going to try to skip ahead because I probably have too many slides. In Minneapolis, this is the city of Minneapolis, and Minneapolis was released from the legal obligation to be integrated in 1995. So I had the privilege of going to Minneapolis public schools when they were integrated under court order. In 1995, they were released from court order. And I'm going to show you a time series about what happened when the, there was no longer supervision or legal supervision of the schools. You can see each of those circles is an elementary school. And the green part of the circle is American Indian kids. The orange part is Asian Pacific Islanders. Yellow is Hispanic. Red is black. And white is blue. Now, uh, I'm, this, I'm going to show you a time series. It's going to be animated. And you're going to see that it's a, quite an integrated system. will become a white system in the southwest part of the city. The near south part of the city will become black and Latino and then Latino. The north side will become black and Asian and then just pretty much black over the time. It's, and this, these are the years after the court order. So here's 95, 96, 97. And you see those schools, particularly south of the lakes uh, in the southwest corner, becoming bluer and bluer. 
And you're going to start to see now about 2004 and 5 rapid declines in school population. Minneapolis will go from 50,000 students to 30,000 in about eight and a half years. So here you can see schools start to disappear. Now you can see uh, the schools around the lakes, Lake Harriet and Lake Calhoun, largely white, a couple of more than 90% white. You can see the schools in the near south side become Latino and the schools in the north side and lots of schools disappearing in the poorest neighborhoods becoming uh, Let's see, how do I go backwards this way? Okay, so this is the, the final picture. This is the most recent period. Now, those white schools south of the lakes, some of them have the highest test scores of any public school in Minnesota. There's a school called Lake Harriet that three or four years has had the highest test scores of any public school in Minnesota, a state chess champion team. Uh, you know, and, and the same school district as schools on the north side that have the lowest test scores in the metropolitan area. They say in Minneapolis, if your kids go to Lake Harriet, they go to Yale. And if you go to North Star Elementary in North Minneapolis, you go to jail. And that is, uh, it's not completely true. There's not that many kids from Lake Harriet School that go to Yale. There's some. But there are a lot of kids at North Star. In fact, that area in the north side of Minneapolis is becoming more powerfully connected to the criminal justice system than it's ever been in our history. So this is. Can you explain with the legal change what? Change. Like what, would, what would not have happened well, if the law had not changed? The, if the law had not changed, the, the schools <coughs> would all be within about 20 points of each other. No school would be more than 20 points How different. How would they have prevented families from moving? They would have withdrawn aid to those schools uh, if they were not integrated. They would have had to, uh, another thing that the Twin Cities had, and I'm going to talk about in a minute, they had a very proactive housing program. So beginning in 1971, at the behest of George Romney, who was, the, was Nixon's secretary of HUD, Minneapolis embarked on a pilot program called the Open Communities Initiative. And for almost 20 years, we built 70% of subsidized housing in the widest part of suburbia. So one of the reasons we didn't have any segregated schools was we had this very proactive housing plan under these very strong rules. And the, these all came apart during this period when we, d we moved from racial integration as a legal imperative, which certainly was controversial and growingly so, to racial uh, integration is presumptively illegal. And, uh, uh, and this was a big part of the change. Now, I'm going to show you Minneapolis in terms of poverty. And again, you're going to see the white parts of the city where you have some of the best schools in the state. They'll lose all the red areas, which are poor, and the other parts of the city will lose all the blue areas who are middle class kids. So this is the same time series. So race and poverty, again, locked tightly in Minneapolis very different school system, really three school systems. A white school system, one of the highest achieving, higher often than Edina, which is one of the more affluent suburbs. A Latino system, very low achieving, and an African American system among the lowest achieving in the state with the lowest opportunities. Here's testing, and again, this is just what I said. You can see the South, these are the, the standard tests, the MCA tests that kids get every year. You can see in Lake Harriet School, almost everybody uh, exceeding standards, and you can see in many of the North Side neighborhoods, not, kids not meeting standards. What's that? Have the test scores also changed over time? Uh, yeah, somewhat, a little bit. But uh, it's hard to get a long series of tests. I mean, one of the hard problems is we know that in the last 10 years, we have stunning levels of disparity. But before that, we don't have consistent measures. We have measures from the 70s, partly from court-ordered integration plans that show small disparities. But we don't have a long-term timeline. Certainly, these huge disparities between whites and blacks are a product of the last 10 or 15 years. Um, here's suburban schools, and one of the things is this, this is not a problem of just central cities, but also suburbs. And in the United States and in the Twin Cities, more than half of black and Latino families live in the suburbs. And uh, the sad thing is, as black and Latino families move to the suburbs, they experience very significant and ongoing forms of residential discrimination. Steering is one of the most powerful ones. So uh, studies throughout the country and in the Twin Cities show that black families of a given level of income, education, credit history are shown parts of the suburbs where the schools are integrated. And white families of the same income, education, and credit histories are shown much wider areas of the suburbs. So that really changes the housing market. When you think about a housing market, one of the biggest and most powerful and sensitive segments is married families with children. And white married families with children are a dominant characteristic. When suddenly their demand is withdrawn from a certain housing market, it's very hard to keep the price up. It's very hard for blacks to act in a concerted enough way to maintain the price pressure. So when you start to see steering, you're going to see changes in price. 
almost immediately reflected. And this is true, steering, as measured by the Urban Institute, has been actually increasing since they first began to measure steering, and it's certainly present in local studies. And this is an area, the Osseo School District and the Robbinsdale School District, were black middle class families, uh, particularly settled in that period of time. And I'm going to show you the same time series from 1995 to 96 in terms of those schools. And you can see majority white in pretty much all regards, although the schools closest to the central cities are more diverse, African American being the red part. So this is 95 to 96, 97, 98, 99. 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. And again, you can see the same patterns reproducing them in the suburbs. These neighborhoods that were where the schools were becoming majority black and Latino were also places of, re of relatively falling home prices. Credit was sharply limited in those areas. Credit it came down, price fell. A lot of black families bought into those neighborhoods at high prices and lost their wealth in this transition. Uh, banks said the, the prices were changing. They pulled tight credit. Uh, uh, people said that the banks were discriminating. They said uh, there was less demand. These are complicated internal problems. Segregation involves racial steering, mortgage lending discrimination, exclusionary zoning, all sorts of patterns that interlock with each other. They're hard to say that one particular thing does it or not, but it's certainly present. So you can see these patterns in the older suburbs changing. Now, many times, in these situations, uh, a, a, a triggering event would occur in these suburbs. And it, this, this is, I think, very common throughout the country. Uh, the suburb would expand and they would need to build a new school or the suburb would lose population and they would need to cl close an older school. And in that time, when a, sc a new school would be built and an old school would be closed, there was the possibility of mischief with the boundaries. The boundaries could reflect uh, the racial composition of the neighborhoods. Uh, they could ameliorate the division between the neighborhoods by trying to cross the areas, or uh, they could be worse. They could be worse. They could draw schools boundaries that were more segregated than neighborhoods. And very often, pressure internal to these communities would cause the boundaries to be drawn in a way that was more segregated than the residential neighborhoods. And when the school boundaries became more residentially segregated, the schools became more segregated, steering increased even more. So these are hard intractable problems. Uh, free lunch, again, the same thing happens. The uh, racial change is followed by social change in the northern suburbs. Testing, again, very similar, very high correlation. The same thing's happening in the southern suburbs. This is Richfield and Bloomington. I'm just going to skip quickly ahead, but you can see the same kinds of patterns, a larger pattern of Latino migration, but also significant steering very tight mortgage lending, uh, very hard to get prime credit in those neighborhoods. In the Twin Cities, a black family that earns $167,000 a year is less likely to qualify for a prime loan than a white family that earns $40,000 a year. That's the Humda data. It's the largest disparity in the country. And when confronted with this, uh, the banks say the difference is explained through credit history, but the credit histories are proprietary. One of the things I think the Fed could do is look into this. Uh, I've seen Feds in other parts of the country go back and look at these credit histories, and they've been seen as an honest broker uh, that can protect confidentiality. But this is the largest disparity in mortgage lending in the country, and uh, it would be good to look into. Um, so I mean, uh, poverty in the southern suburbs, I'm going to get a little bit onto a couple of other things. Um, charter schools. Now. I was a member of the legislature in the 1990s, and I voted for charter schools uh, as a member of the legislature. And the idea of charter schools then was that they would be more integrated and they would be better. Well, charter schools, we have now 20 years of data on charter schools, which, which were created here. They are more segregated and they are lower performing. That's our peer-reviewed published data, but also the Brookings Institution and many other institutions in the country, at least board independent sources have included the same thing. Now, charter schools have emerged in a very segregated niche. They're much more segregated than the public schools, and it appears that they're causing the public schools to be more segregated than they otherwise would be. Now, the public schools have been pretty good at making themselves segregated all by themselves, but charter schools make it happen a little bit faster. Now, this is charter schools. When you saw Minneapolis population declining, you start to see the charter population increasing. Those red schools are all black charters. The blue schools are mostly white <coughs> charters. Uh, the yellow schools are Latino charters. Uh, the orange are Asian. Now, one of the things that's interesting is charters tend to be racially homogeneous in the Twin Cities. We have 161 of them. Only five of them are what we'd call racially integrated, between 20 and 60 percent non-white. And they market themselves in thematic ways. So, for example, there's, there's one in St. Paul called the German Immersion Academy, which is 95 percent white. And it's in a, it's in a racially diverse neighborhood. 
And they say, we're not segregating. This is, we're not intentionally segregating. Any poor black or Latino child is welcome if they want to study in German all day. <laughs> and and uh, on the other hand, we have the Higher Ground Academy, which is entirely black and low income. And it has a curriculum that's based on that strata. And they say, we're not segregated, that any middle class white kid who wants to go to an Ivy League school is welcome to come here to Higher Ground Academy. And so you have complicated, interesting legal questions. Now, as a lawyer, one of the clearest outcomes of Brown versus Board of Education is if two children live on the same block, and one is black and one is white, they shouldn't be going to separate schools. That's what Brown says. Now, after that, Brown becomes much more complicated. What if a city's segregated? Brown is more complicated. But Brown is very clear. If the kids live on the same block, a black kid and a white kid live on the same block, you shouldn't have a separate school for a black kid and a separate school for a white kid. The charter system, there's lots of black kids and white kids that live on the same block, and the black kids go to an all-black school, and the white kids go to a nearly all-white school. Now, they say this is different. This is about choice. This isn't discrimination. These are different questions, but they're, they're, they're complicated. And we can talk a little bit more about what the law says about this. So here's the charter schools in 2004 and 2005. Here's the charter schools in 2007, 2008, growing rapidly. More white ones, more all black ones, more all Asian ones, more Latino ones. Here's the charter schools in uh, 2010 to 2011, growing rapidly, uh, 2012 to 2013. You can see the growth, particularly of all black and all white charter schools, going the fastest. Um, this is the racial composition of the metro, 66% white. You can see the 14% black. This is the racial composition of charters. Uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a time series. This is a time series of the growth of charters since 1995. There is a few in 1995. 96, 97, 98, 90. you can see them growing. The red ones are schools that would be considered segregated if they were included under the same integration regime as the public schools. Uh, the green ones would be uh, predominantly white and the blue ones would be integrated. So you can see the growth of the charters in the cities and the older suburbs. So big parts of the city's enrollment, 25, 30%. One of the things we found is in the second generation of charter schools, they, the second place they started to pop up, the first place was very poor neighborhoods in central cities. The second place that they started to pop up in big numbers were racially diverse inner ring suburbs. And particularly when racially diverse inner ring suburbs would integrate their school boundaries. When they would decide to make the school boundaries more integrated than neighborhood boundaries. A, a famous local condition is Eden Prairie. The Eden Prairie School District underwent a very public fight to make their school districts all about 20% non-white within the realm of uh, the law. And they had a charter school that was nearly all white that popped up and grew dramatically. Apple Valley Rosemount, which is a school that's racially diverse and is good about integration, they have a white charter school. The eastern part of Bloomington, uh, which is very racially diverse, has a very white charter school. And these are growing fast. And this is another problem. Uh, when you have these charters growing up, particularly when they're popping up when local suburban school districts are trying to be integrated, this is a, this is a, a problem. Uh, there, it shows that it's causing, it's putting pressure on the public schools to create white alternatives on the one side and uh, single race black alternatives and Latino alternatives on the other side. Minneapolis and St. Paul have both had to seek waivers from federal civil rights programs to create single race black, Latino, and Hmong schools, which have not performed well over time. But so you have a race toward creating single race black schools and a race toward uh, school districts creating white alternatives to compete with the charters. These are charter schools that were closed for financial impropriety or misappropriation of funds. And it isn't a comprehensive list, but it's a list of all the newspaper articles we could find in the two major papers. Uh, this is test scores. And I'm in the, I'm, I'm, my time is running out, but I think this is going to be particularly interesting to this audience. We looked at poverty and proficiency rates, and we tried to correct for all the things that we could think of, high mobility, uh, English as second language, uh, homelessness. Uh, we tried to create a regression. We took a look at these schools, and, and the blue diamonds are uh, public schools. The red are charters. Now, you can see on one edge of the spectrum, you have zero percentage of the kids on free lunch, and then the, the per percentage proficient is quite high. And you can see as you get to 100% kids on free lunch, uh, score proficiency goes down. And the most powerful predictor of test scores in a school is poverty. It's a very powerful power. You can almost, it explains 80%, 90% of the difference. Now, what's interesting about this is the charter schools, there are some that outperform the public schools. You can see in the lower end, but the majority of them underperform public schools with a similar population. So year after year, study after study, our research, all the other peer-reviewed research for 20 years shows that they either, are, uh, the, the most optimistic research is that are about the same but uh, consistently they're lower scoring given the same student body. 
but they're growing very fast. And this is, uh, this is reading. Oh, no, this is math, I'm sorry. The same result. And you can see there are, there, in this, this particular measure, you can see 4,320 students in the upper range of kids outperforming the public schools, but you can see 6,108 6,100 students below. And again, it's a complicated picture, but they're more below than above. And if you're thinking about charters as an institution, they underperform the public schools. Now, there's some that are better. Increasingly, our research is suggesting that the ones that are outperforming the public schools have very low percentages of kids on special education, have very low percentage of kids at English language learners. They look oddly different from the other public schools in terms of some of the characteristics of kids that would draw down the test scores. Um, Open enrollment is another thing that we've created. It's an idea that you should be able to choose your school. And uh, this was an also an idea that it was supposed to create more integration. And it does create some more integration. Some African-American kids use this to uh, opt into wealthier and whiter school districts. But overwhelmingly, it's been, a, it's been used by white kids to avoid racially diverse settings. So it's had, a, it's had one of the accelerating effects, charters and public uh, uh, and open enrollment. I'm not going to have a chance to talk about housing, but we moved from a uh, regime when we were building about 70% in the white suburbs to only about 8% now. And uh, both the charter industries, the, uh, the companies and the organizations behind them, and the evolving use of the low-income housing tax credit, which is only lightly regulated by federal civil rights law, have led uh, toward Minneapolis returning to much more segregated schools and much more segregated placement of affordable housing. So we moved from a time of, of very strong integration, really almost utopian in terms of, uh, of integration, never equal, to a time of looking a lot like, more like the rest of the country, ha becoming a lot more like the rest of the country very rapidly, and being much more segregated than our racial counterparts in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. And I think, I'm just a lawyer, but I think this is at the heart of uh, some of these disparities. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for uh, discussion with this extraordinary uh, set of panelists. Um, the lights are a little blinding, uh, but I think I see, is that Bill? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. So, uh, Myron, uh, you touched on something directly the Fed does oversee. And I was wondering, uh, Sandy, to what extent when you've done these area studies, you've incorporated the Humda data to look at these kind of disparities. Uh, the other element is that often real estate agents have preferred relationships with mortgage banking. So the steering isn't so independent no, it's, of, <laughs> of the banking industry itself. No. I and um, and it, it, we have the CFPB because the Fed didn't do its job. It was supposed to have prevented discrimination in credit. That was the agency originally given the role of being cop. Um, and having been around the cops of the Department of Labor, um, I found the Fed to be quite unique. Because at the Department of Labor, uh, we were always accused of you know, looking under anything we saw wage theft. The Fed somehow or another looks under anything and sees nothing. Uh, <laughs> so uh, can you? Talk a little more, Myron, about the Humda yes. the disparity. And Sandy, to what extent, because housing is a key element of wealth holding for the typical household, it's their major form of wealth. Um, in your look at, at individual cities, have you looked at this pattern that Myron has, uh, has carefully documented for Minneapolis about housing segregation, and Humda data disparities. I could just say that I know that when you read the studies about steering, real estate agents in the, in the literature about steering, uh, part of their reason for steering is real estate agents practice in very small geographic areas, and they want to maintain very tight connections with all the sources of information about new housing, and they feel that introducing uh, diverse uh, uh, residents could hurt their information networks. Another reason that re real estate agents don't show African-Americans housing in white neighborhoods is because they don't think they'll be able to qualify their loans, no matter what their income is. And it's a waste of time, then, to show 
an African American family a house in a diner or Minnetonka because uh, they're not going to get qualified for the loan. So I mean, I think they are tightly interrelated in the in the literature about steering. Yeah, we haven't explored this yet with our data, but we do have the capacity to look at residential segregation because we do have information about the precise location of each of the uh, each of the respondents' residences. Uh, and in a study that we are trying to develop as a repeat investigation of Boston, uh, we are going to try to obtain credit scores from the respondents. And so we can then examine whether or not uh, there's a, a, a strong correspondence between their credit scores and the other economic information that we have about them and whether or not there's variation by race. And so, uh, so that hasn't been done yet, but hopefully it will be done. Neil Kashkari. Uh, Myron, uh, two-part question. I found your uh, time series very, obviously, persuasive and compelling. But my understanding in the last 20 years or so in Minnesota is that Minnesota as a state has become much more diverse. So isn't part of it you're seeing a huge immigration of people of color yeah, yeah. and then where they are able to live or choosing to live? Yeah. No, this is, this is, I, I think this is a big part of it, is we became a lot more diverse. We're still the third widest metropolitan area of the top 50, but we moved from second or first, and we are more diverse, but we're no more diverse than Portland or Seattle, which has experienced these changes too. But that's a part of it, you know, certainly, is that we kind of dropped the civil, we dropped our pro-integrative civil rights regime at the same time. We had large-scale immigration of sure. different races of people. And then just to follow up on the, on the charter school point, I've seen that data too. My takeaway from that, though, may be a little different than yours, because I look at that, and we're very Minnesota nice about charter schools. Right? We don't shut down failing charter schools, and so mm. then the data is what it is. And I, how do you think about that? Well, it's, I mean, charter schools are very, very skillful politically. They are able to uh, you know, uh, employ some of the most powerful activists in the neighborhood, and uh, they can be more customer friendly in lots of ways than the public schools, less bureaucratic. So they're very, very hard to shut down. Any school is hard to shut down, but when one has a lot of politically operative, strong people in neighborhoods, like in New York in the Tammany period, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to do that. Yes, sir. This is for Professor Darity. So in my way of categorizing this, there's only two ways people with similar income streams can have different wealth levels, either different savings or different return on investments over their lifetimes. You have different savings patterns over the lifetimes or different return on investments over the lifetimes. Does your data to let us know which it is? Uh, actually, it's neither. OK. so. If you were to uh, adjust for household income, if, if, we're if we're talking about racial differences, okay, not, not necessarily individual variations within a group, uh, if, you, if you control for household income, there's no significant difference in savings rates between blacks and whites. And if you control for household income, there's no significant differences in rates of return on portfolios. So if you then want to argue that all the variation is attributable to income variation, well, that's not consistent with the data that I showed you about uh, the quintile distribution of income and corresponding levels of net worth. So the answer to the puzzle has to reside in intergenerational transmission effects. It's not a consequence of savings decisions that are made within a corresponding generation across, uh, across racial groups. And um, indeed, the, 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 the findings that I just reported to you about savings rates is, uh, is, is evidence that's documented in a study by Wolf and Gittleman, and there's a new report by Tom Shapiro and his team at Brandeis called the asset value of whiteness in which they also demonstrate that there are no significant savings rates discrepancies once you take into account household income. So it's neither of those factors that explain racial disparities in, in, in wealth. I think you have to look very carefully at the question of what types of resources 
an older generation is transmitting to the next. And then that gets us to the question of why black families have less resources to transmit to the next generation. But that's embedded deeply in the whole historical record of, uh, of, of, of wealth deprivation by race in, in an American society, dating from the failure to provide the ex-slaves with 40 acres and a mule up through the process of the kinds of wealth creating opportunities that were associated with the GI Bill and with federal home loan subsidy programs uh, in, in, in the post-World War II period. Uh, it was very interesting to see the, you know, rise in uh, segregation uh, across races. But race and income, as we just said, you know, are very correlated. Poverty and uh, um, and race are very much correlated. And how much is race and how much in income is very important question to ask because it actually leads to very different, you know, policies uh, answers. So. How much, I mean, can you actually uh, replicate the same picture in the same time series, just looking at how much, you know, a school is um, uh, attended by poor kids yeah. versus rich kids? Or it's, so, you know, like, uh, how much can we actually address the issue by addressing poverty? And how much instead we need to think about policies that have a clear race-based, you know, sort of answer. In, in, the, in the Northeast and Midwest, race and poverty are tightly, tightly correlated. So as I said, three quarters of poor black and Latino kids in the Twin Cities and most of the Northeast and Midwest go to very high poverty schools. And three quarters of poor white kids go to middle income schools. We've been, I've been involved in different parts of the country where you've created economically incentivized programs trying to avoid uh, having programs be declared unconstitutional on, based on race. We had the Choice is Yours, which is a city suburban school desegregation program for the first several years. Even though the neighborhoods that it served were overwhelmingly black and poor, almost 20% of the kids that used the program, where maybe they were 1% of the neighborhood, were white. So it's one of the problems is how tightly they fit. White poor people don't tend to live in concentrated poverty outside of Appalachia. If you look at a white school anywhere in the Northeast or Midwest, it's going to be a very affluent place. If you, if you look at a black school, almost anywhere in the Northeast or Midwest, it's going to be very poor or rapidly becoming poor. We'll take one more question from uh, the floor, and then I'd like to extend the opportunity to our panelists, if you would like, the option to pose a question to one another. Uh, in the middle here. Um, on the interge intergenerational transfer, is, it, is liabilities, are, are liabilities passed down? I'm just thinking, how do you get to $8 of net wealth in, in Boston? Um, I mean, I'm not sure why that's so baffling. I mean, if you, if you think about the experiences of, of many, many households where I think in general, um, if, if a household is confronted with uh, an additional expense of $400 in a given month, many households are not able to actually cover that expense. So uh, to the extent that people are exhausting the income that they receive and do not have any other source of wealth, uh, then it's, it's, not, it's not particularly surprising that you could get that low a level of net worth. But of course, as, as, as you suggested, uh, net worth is the difference between uh, the value of assets and the value of, of, of debts, what you own versus what you, what you owe. And so, uh, indeed, it is possible for families to be uh, transferring liabilities across generations. But I think that low levels of wealth, particularly among blacks, are more strongly associated with a low asset position than a low debt position. It's, it's actually quite hard to accumulate any significant amount of debt if your income and your wealth position already is low. Uh, so, um, but I, I'm, I'm not, the $8 figure is startling because it is so low, but I'm not so sure why we might think it's, uh, it's, it's inconceivable for it to, it to be at that level. To our panelists, would any of you like to pose a question to? I'm sorry, can I just oh, yes. 
Um, Sandy, uh, I, I'm sorry for interrupting, but you have a very important slide that you didn't get to show because you were just talking about intergenerational gifts. Now, one of the slides you've produced before show how blacks are far more likely at even low levels of wealth to give to their children for education. Yes. So in talking about what is being passed on, I think it's important to talk about that element because I think people may think it's, uh, well, blacks don't pass on for education, so that's one of the advantages. Yeah, so, so you know, for, for the focus on savings behavior as a source of these wealth differentials, I need to point out that the median black wealth circa 2013 was in the vicinity of six to $7,000 nationally, whereas median white wealth is in the vicinity of 120 to $130,000. It depends a bit on whether you look at SIP data or whether you look at the SCF data. But, uh, but those discrepancies are so enormous that it would require blacks to take uh, three years of saving 100% of their income at the median household uh, to close that gap out of savings behavior. Okay. Uh, so that said, uh, black households that have a median net worth of about $23,000 will provide some resources to their children's college education whereas the median for white households who do not provide any support for their kids' college education is about $75,000. So that's the discrepancy I think that you're talking about. But it's significant that the black households who do are well above the median for all black households. So, yeah. Question. Sorry, I know you want to get to interpanel discussions, but I'm on this fact, very same point. Um, of all the things that house that that uh, grandparents can pass to their kids, part is cash, mm -hmm. part is cash for the grandchildren's education, but part is actually um, what Glenn and this is why Glenn introduced the very idea of social capital. It's social capital. That is to say. I have done a ton for my grandchildren, even though in my will there is zero for my grandchildren. Nevertheless, they've inherited a ton because they've inherited the connections that come with being the grandchild of somebody who's a Harvard professor. I don't mean to be highly personal about it, but that, that I'm wondering whether you've thought at all about partitioning the total inheritance that comes from parents or grandparents into the part that is actually literally financial, that is passing bucks. And how much of it is in the terms yeah. that... So, so we actually have a study where we look at the effects of the actual estimated transfer payments, estimated based upon the reports that uh, we've received from the parent and grandparent generation. And that accounts for approximately 15% of the, the third generation's wealth. Okay. But it's an underestimate given the kinds of issues that you're raising and that I raised about the importance of the timing of the transfer, about the uh, level of, of security and health that an individual experiences in a wealthier household, and also the networking effects. And so, uh, so I, I'm not sure we can parcel out the, uh, the non-direct transfer effects, but we can look at the magnitude of the transfer effects. That 15% sounds low, but it's the largest contributing factor out of all of the variables that we've typically incorporated into a wealth determination equation. Okay, I'll ditch my plan to have a little dialogue among the panelists. We'll have Catherine Newton <coughs> in back, and then this gentleman up in, in, in front, and then we will conclude. Thanks so much. I wanted to ask a question of Glenn. Um, first of all, thanks. Thank you for that presentation. It was uh, fascinating, moving. Um, so I wrote a critique of um, *Coming Apart*, Charles Murray's book *Coming Apart*, and and uh, my the same, which is really about the differences in behavior by class among white people. Yeah. Right. 
And uh, in that book, Murray has a series of charts of attitudes, and then he has a series of charts about behavior. And uh, those charts, which he really never discusses about attitudes, actually show that poor and working class whites have more conservative attitudes than middle class whites. Yet, when you look at behavior, it's turned around, and it was by contention that that's where we have to look for, for the story, right? Why is it that, that poor whites and working class whites are less active less able to behave in accordance with their own goals as opposed uh, to whites. So um, I suspect you weren't a complete adherent of, of uh, coming apart, and I would love to hear your thoughts uh, about that. Well, thanks for uh, the kind word. <clears throat> and uh, I have to confess that I haven't read coming apart, although I've read a ton of reviews, et cetera, perhaps even yours. Um, and I, I put in mind of the uh, popular book by J.D. Vance, you know, um, Hillbilly Elegy, which is a, a similar, um, similar nature. Um, I want to respond in this way and briefly. Yesterday at lunch, I heard Sandra Samuels say more than once, we have to change the way that people are thinking about achievement and about what's possible for them and for their kids. She talked about cultivating a culture of achievement. Okay? Now, the idea that attitudes, values, and beliefs could be uh, consequential for material outcomes, childhood uh, development, educational attainment, and ultimate uh, success later in life, is in my mind not inconsistent with um, being concerned about uh, the legacy of historical discrimination or about the uh, inequality producing consequences of contemporary discriminatory practices. Um, it's a, it's, it's interesting. I know I'm not directly answering you, Catherine. Uh, you've said white lower class people are uh, exhibiting, uh, you say, more conservative. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Attitudes about their uh, lives or their children's lives than white middle class people, and yet they're not actually actually able to get their behavior uh, to be commensurate with those attitudes. Um, and what I saw in uh, Sandra Samuels yesterday was a, a deep concern uh, about cultivating attitudes and about intervening with families so as to be able to line their behavior up more with the, uh, with the views about what's possible for their children that she was hoping to cultivate. Um, and I just want to say that's a really important illustration of what I mean by um, uh, development by a development narrative. It doesn't preclude, uh, it doesn't rule out uh, a concern about uh, anti-black discrimination or about unequal opportunity, but it embraces a responsibility and an imperative uh, to, I mean, what does she say? People knocking on the doors look like the people who answered the doors. Not everybody can go and knock on those doors and look like the people who answer the doors. What does she say? She and her husband and their family have sucked down roots in that community. They're living in that community. They're trying to develop that community. There's no inconsistency between an, uh, um, a passionate uh, advocacy of equal opportunity and uh, an embrace of responsibility to develop the potential of African American people. And that's really all I'm trying to say here. You have the final word. Um, Ezell Jones, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, now that I'm a PhD, but uh, I, I just want to get your opinion. Uh, are you, if you're familiar with U UNCF, uh, uh, United Negro College Fund, many of the participants there are first generation success. And in the data in America for that group, Dr. Lowry, that you appeared before, most of them were uh, from historical black colleges and everything. And I want to know what your opinion of and, and how the graduates of those institutions appear to per capita in American society are the greatest contributors. As, I just want to talk about, not talk about, I want you just to respond and give me open-ended comments or your thoughts about the value of uh, UNCF to uh, the work that we're doing as far as first generational uh, graduates and everything that's in families. Are you asking me? Or the group, anyone on okay. the that know about it and contextually can talk about it relative to uh, all the issues we've been dealing with today? Well, I'll just say briefly, I mean, I think the institutions are very important. I have six grandchildren, uh, two of which, two of whom, 
uh, are enrolled at uh, historically black uh, colleges. And uh, I mean, in a way, it's, uh, uh, it seems to me at the level of higher education to exemplify mm -hmm. The kind of sorting dynamic um, that Myron was referring to in K through 12 education of people finding uh, a niche for themselves uh, within the menu of possible institutions that they can attend. There's a historical uh, legacy, of course, in um, the HBCUs, but uh, they are they are an important component of the range of uh, educational opportunities for African Americans, uh, given that people are looking both to acquire human capital, uh, but also to affirm, uh, you know, identity norms and, um, you know, uh, f uh, have an experience at the college level, which is, uh, sit fits into their larger life plan and self-conception. That would be what I'd say. Um, I did, uh, I, I, with some collaborators, I did an article that may be of interest to you that was in the American Prospect. It's called Still We Rise, and it's about the significance and importance of historically black colleges and universities. And I think it's, it's transparent that they have been vital and continue to be vital in terms of producing, uh, uh, producing folks who take, do PhDs or enter the medical profession or other professions in the United States, that they produce more blacks who uh, attain those professional positions proportionately than uh, do the historically white colleges and, and universities. And, and from that standpoint, if we're thinking about issues of upward mobility that might be facilitated through education, the historically black colleges and universities are, are still uh, critical, critical to that task. Thank you very much. That brings uh, to conclusion this session. Um, I need a ruling from the organizers. Do we respect the 15-minute length of the coffee break, or do we respect the reconvene at 10? 15 minutes for coffee, and we'll be back then at 10 hours.
So we're going to begin our last session, which is on takeaways for the Federal Reserve. Now, this has been a conference has been convened as an opportunity for those of us at the Fed to listen to and learn from so many people who know so much about these issues. And in many cases, not just in terms of research, but who've been actively working in the community and at the coalface trying to affect change. Uh, so it's now our time. Uh, we've talked a little bit uh, about some of the Fed's capabilities to help in this way. We heard from Jeff and John and, and Wilbert yesterday about some of our data collection initiatives. And the aim of this last uh, session is to kind of try and draw all of that together as much as possible and put it into a, get down to brass tacks ex of exactly what the Fed system can do to further advance this work. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, you know, it, well, in doing that, I should say, you know, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we, uh, there have been so many things that have been talked about here, we're not going to be able to do justice to them all. We're also very sensitive to the point that Sandra made at lunch yesterday that, you know, you can't necessarily pull out one or two things uh, to focus on and neglect the fact that so many things are interconnected here. Uh, but we're going to have to probably uh, at least confine our remarks to a small amount of what's been discussed, uh, although we are sensitive to the fact that we need to keep uh, the big picture in mind. So the plan for this session is uh, each of uh, the panelists are going to give uh, some prepared remarks uh, that both illustrate how the things we've learned uh, are going to influence what we already do, perhaps advertise some of the things that we currently do that uh, can contribute to this, as well as talk about the takeaways they are going to uh, take back to them in their work. Uh, I'll probably intervene a little bit more than the average uh, moderator, uh, but after that we'll open it up. Uh, and when I open it up, what I'm going to be looking for is for other people in the Fed system to talk about what they're going to take away, uh, to hear from some of the other people about some work that we're doing that maybe hasn't been done justice uh, so far in the conference, such as some of the many community development initiatives that are going on in each of the Federal Reserve Banks. And lastly, for all of the non-Fed people, uh, I hope you'll let us know if we've taken the right lessons away uh, and whether or not there are other things we should be thinking about as well. Uh, so with that introduction out of the way, Aishigul is uh, going to uh, take the lead with the first, uh, first talk. So I prepared some slides to summarize my main takeaways. So I'll mostly draw from the human capital and mobility panel. And I'll try to talk about what I learned here. And then I'll try to put these new things that I learned in the context of the work that we have been doing at the New York Fed. And then hopefully I'll try to give some ideas about where we think of, uh, where we think of bringing these lessons to. So, can we go back? Okay, so the first takeaway is, as we all know, and that's why we are here, income growth has not been inclusive. And this plot that I borrowed from Emmanuel makes this point really well. The average income growth was around 1.4%, and you had to go all the way up to the 88 percentile to see such, in, such an income growth. And you see this inflection point that the top 0.001% experience enormous amount of growth. And on top of that, and this is Philip's work, there is little lifetime mobility conditional on where you went to college. You can see that conditional on where you went to college, your early career salary pretty much predicts what you're going to make mid-career. And this is, of course, for college graduates. Then I, it reminded me a paper that I'm very fond of by Fatih Kiven and Fatih Karan and their co-authors, Askan and Song. This is looking at income earnings growth <coughs> from age 25 to age 55. So they have data from the Social Security Administration for males between age 25 and 60. And they look at their lifetime earnings, and they rank them, and then they look at how much earnings growth these people experience. So for median worker, the increase in this 30 years is just 
Again, similar to Emmanuel's plot, you have to go all the way to 80th percentile to reach to the average, which is around 150%. And there is enormous earnings growth in the top 1%. This is 26-fold increase. So this concentration and this skewness is something that we see when we look at over time or over the life cycle. And whenever you look at, in most macro statistics, you see this kind of skewness. I'm partial to explanations that are based on trade and technology, but a key lesson that I learned from our discussions today is there's definitely a role for institutions, tax policy, Education, financial and labor market regulations. So we can discuss whether these are causing this, or we could discuss whether we can use this to alleviate these patterns. But regardless of that, there is an important role for these kind of things that we should be thinking about. Definitely institutions, tax policy, education will matter for uh, what's going to happen to these patterns. So I was aware of these facts pretty much as a labor economist. But what I didn't know was this rise in family instability. I live in New York City, and when I go to the playground, I see some kids eating organic rainbow carrots, and I see some of them eating frozen chicken fingers. But I thought, I live in New York City, in a very diverse neighborhood, and I also see some mothers that are as old as grandmothers. But I didn't realize how widespread this family instability was. And this is Sarah and Katie's work. And you can see this big rise in single motherhood from around 5% to 40% for the total population. And again, this is something that I didn't appreciate before, that a huge fraction of kids, before they reach their fifth birthday in these really vulnerable years, they experience some sort of instability and complexity in their family environment. So again, a key lesson I took away from this is, this is actually from Katie's slides, anything to improve mobility must include family context into which children are born and raised. Because this is creating a reverse, the negative feedback loop. Inequality is creating more and more instability and complexity in the family structures. And kids who are raised in these environments are underperforming and this is creating more inequality. So I learned that we have to break this, and we have to break this at a very early points in life of children. And again, Janet Carey's work showed me that there is actually room for policy intervention. Some policies actually worked. And now I want to go back to what we have been doing at the New York Fed and relate my key lessons to uh, my own research, like as every economist does. So unemployment risk is highly uneven. We, we have seen various, um, various statistics looking at unemployment rate, unemployment increases by demographic characteristics. I'll do something slightly different. I will look at unemployment risk by weekly earnings quantiles. So the yellow one here is only for full-time workers. Zero to 20 earnings quantile unemployment risk is around three times higher. And if I include part-time workers, it's around four times higher. But remember that this is where we also see a lot of family instability. This is where we see very low savings. This is where we see this financial vulnerability. So these are people who are not able to raise $400 if they have an emergency. And this is what made me think again what Ed Lazier said. Our, one of our mandates is maximum employment, and this is really where we see the vulnerabilities. So if we fulfill that, we are really fulfilling something, because where all these vulnerabilities lie is where unemployment risk is very high and also highly cyclical. And then I want to touch upon what Greg talked about. When we look at workers, we sometimes don't appreciate that they actually work for a firm. They work for someone. So there is a lot of things going on on the firm side as well. And in addition to just looking at how many jobs we create, we have to understand how labor demand is formed, where it is in terms of geographics, occupation, skills, and as you said, as Greg said, in terms of tasks. 
So one thing that we have been looking at is what's happening on the firm side. We see a very stark decline in entrepreneurship in the US economy. So this is the firm formation rate. You could look at it in two ways. In 1980, 14% of firms were new firms. And by 2010, it went down to 8%. There was a big drop during the Great Recession that we all talked about, but we really see very little comeback. And as a result of this, in 1980, 4% of workers were working in uh, young firms, and it went down to now uh, 2%. So young firms and young workers go together. Again, there is a, this decline in entrepreneurship and uh, startups will have very important consequences for young workers' career paths. And as a result of this entrepreneurship, again, something Emmanuel talked about, there is a rise in market power when we think about competition for workers. So this is the distribution of employment in startups, young firms that are younger than 10 years old, and mature firms. And you can see the size distribution as well. In, 19, uh, in late 1980s, two thirds of the workers were working in these old firms. And if I fast forward, you see that more and more workers are now working in these mature firms. So this, of course, changes competition for workers because startups compete for workers. They have to just come into the market and hire new workers. But when lots of the worker mass employment is at mature firms, there's less competition. So this increases profits and mostly decreases labor share. So I think this is, again, an example of something that Greg talked about. The demand side is really important because if you want to understand earnings disparities, unemployment risk, we really need to understand the firms that employ these workers and their motivations and why, uh, these, why these differences in economic outcomes are generated. So then, what is next? What can we do? So first of all, of course, this goes back to all the discussions that we had. But when the Great Recession hit, we tried to really understand what's happening to the household, the workers, their balance sheet. And I should say that the economists at the Federal Reserve System have been really, really creative in trying to patch together different sorts of data. Because the goal is to really understand all of this. We want to see the labor market experience, earnings, unemployment, and who is employing these people. Family structure, which is very important because we know for labor supply considerations, job search behavior, having kids at home really matter. Household balance sheet, that's also very important. Consumption and wealth patterns. So we still don't have this complete picture, but we have made a lot of progress. We were talked about this. Consumer credit panel allows us to understand where vulnerabilities on the household balance sheets lie. So in a way, uh, there was a discussion about stress testing the consumers. This is really going to help us to understand this when we go forward. And it also helps us to understand whether there's discrimination in terms of lending behavior. Survey of Consumer Expectations is a laboratory that we developed that allows us to ask timely questions on important topics. One thing that we have done is we asked lots of questions about how people find their jobs, and we have seen a lot of differences in different social groups, in the different occupations, different genders, search for jobs and the importance of social networks. And then the other is, going back to the demand side again, in collaboration with the conference board, we now have the, the whole universe of online vacancies in the US economy. So we know where these jobs are, and we know which occupations they are demanding. So this data set that we invested in 2010 allowed us to get a good sense of whether mismatch would be an important problem going forward. Some of us wanted to settle for 7.5, 8% unemployment, but seeing that mismatch is not really the impediment to to the progress in the labor market, we were able to push for more aggressive stabilization policy. So in terms of models, uh, as we talked about, again, we want to have models where we want to put all this data in. Of course, it's very easy to say this, 
but it's very hard to develop these models. But once we start getting there, and I think we are getting close now, we can do two things. First of all, we have a relatively blunt tool, monetary policy or fiscal policy. So we can look at how these policies are going to affect different types of consumers. And once we identify this, we can think about more targeted policies to help out those that are left behind by aggregate stabilization policies. One of, uh, one of my earlier papers with Per Crusell and Toshi Mukayama and uh, Tony Smith, we looked at what would happen if we could completely eliminate unemployment rate fluctuations. And you see that poor households who are subject to higher unemployment risks that I've shown you, the welfare benefits are actually huge. It would be around 4% of average consumption, where you wouldn't see much of a gain in the middle class. And you would still see huge gains on the other side of the distribution because of asset prices. So this is, for example, an example of how we could use these models for policy discussions. And then, as I talked about, uh, there is a lot of um, demand to developing this kind of heterogeneous agent models and respecting the microdata that we have seen. And the hope is in the future we will bring firm and worker heterogeneity together. Because, as I said, just looking at workers is not going to tell us what is going on. We first need to understand who is employing them and why they are employed. And the other issue is labor supply considerations. We tend to focus on unemployment, but labor supply is also vitally important. And we know that people who are employed have very different outcomes, even when they search for jobs. Our survey, Survey of Consumer Expectations, actually show that employed people who are searching jobs as if they are on a different island. They're much more likely to find jobs. They have better social networks. Their friends are employed. So they could find jobs more easily and they will find jobs. They're more likely to have benefits. They're more likely to have better hours and they are way more likely to have better wages. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashigal. Uh, so Stephanie is now going to take the lead. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to largely sum up the, my thoughts about the data portion of our discussion. And it was made very easy because we got so many great comments you know, as part of our session. And so I'm hoping I'm ac <coughs> accurately reflecting the views of what I heard from you know, people who are listening to the session. And then I had some thoughts of my own. Um, so I think one of the main things we heard, you know, when I was listening to people's comments after the presentations was that there are a lot of areas where we don't have very good data and we should think about how to use our existing surveys or perhaps even develop new surveys to incorporate some of these issues that would help us to get more at issues of economic inclusion. And so those included things like looking at social networks, at people's attitudes to try to understand behaviors better, um, to focus on family outcomes, and also um, to look at firms as you know, the places where people are working and try to understand those dynamics better. Um, I think more generally, this points to a role that the Institute could potentially fill to help gather ideas uh, from sort of the directors and also visiting scholars and people in the economics and other communities to um, help us focus and prioritize what should our, you know, what should our surveys be focusing on? So the SCF and the SHED, when they um, are about to field a new survey, they actually already go through an extensive process of thinking, what are issues we need more data about? What are you know, the latest topics we should be trying to focus on? And we could really benefit from input, and perhaps the Institute could serve an organizing you know, principle in this in trying to help direct us towards what some of the most promising areas would be. And likewise, as um, data is expensive, but it's possible we could use more information from, you know, that the Institute could gather about areas where we might think about new methods of data collection to help us to um, be able to answer some of the questions we need. Uh, related to this, I think, is that the board collects and uses a lot of administrative data. And those data um, sometimes don't include a lot of personal uh, details, demographic detail. And obviously, 
the burden on people who provide us with those administrative data should be taken to an, into account. But I think another area that we should potentially think about is whether there are additional reporting requirements for certain types of administrative data we already collect or use that um, could help us to include more demographic details that would make those data more suitable for purposes of addressing um, issues related to economic inclusion. So the Humda data, for instance, do include some demographic detail, and those data are particularly useful. But a lot of the data that we collect um, for administrative purposes are not. Um, so I think another um, place that the Institute can help us is to provide um, to provide like more information about what data are already out there. So not just what data we're collecting. So within the system, we have um, something called Data Finder. It's a database of uh, data. But actually, <laughs> um, when I went to Data Finder, I found this was not very useful for helping me to think about what data might be available to look at issues related to opportunity and economic inclusion. So it seems possible to me that those databases could be improved by making it easier to search for data like that, and also to think about what we make available to the public. So uh, making having a resource where people from who are interested in these topics could go and say, I'm interested in this, what data are out there, be it in the, you know, mostly within obviously the Federal Reserve System, but also even in the broader community, data community that would help me to look for, you know, do research on these topics. So there could be ways that the Institute could help make data more readily available to people. And that actually also, I think, that idea extends to helping people to access other resources that can enhance their research on these topics. So Greg mentioned Hank. <laughs> and um, also, there have been other efforts to develop uh, computer packages that can be used to work with these heterogeneous agent models that's very uh, complicated, like HARC that Chris Carroll's been developing. And so, and there are probably other resources out there that I'm not aware of, but I think it's possible that the Institute could play a role in helping to make people aware of what types of resources are available for people who are interested. And I think there have been a lot of efforts to bring down the costs of working with some of these models. And um, that's something where the Institute, I think, could help play a role in facilitating. Um, Another issue I think around data are, are, is what our infrastructure is for working for these, with these data, administrative data and now big data. These are really infrastructure intensive resources. And um, so the, you know, the Federal Reserve System already has radar, which houses a lot of data, um, particularly on credit and mortgages that are available throughout the system. And we could be thinking about how to use radar and other resources to help us better share data across the system and also think about what the, um, you know, these are also computer intensive. Working with these data is very computer intensive. And do we have the resources we need to uh, work with that, uh, you know, to work with those data efficiently and make that uh, realistic. And I think the last idea I want to raise is sort of falls under the rubric that the, the Federal Reserve System is a big player in a lot of markets. <laughs> and how can we leverage our role in that? Um, so I think, you know, Greg mentioned the fact that we hire lots of economists. We have lots of economists. And by showing, just by showing our interest in these topics, I think we can help um, generate more research to be done on these issues. And that's, I think, a very important role that the Institute can play. And here, actually, I'll give a shout out to the Institute's working paper series that they've recently started, because I think having research from around the system that you know, is on issues of opportunity and economic inclusion all in one place, I think, can potentially really show our face to you know, the broader economics community, sociology, that here we're interested in these types of issues and encourage people to work on them. And I think that that's an important role that um, that the Institute can play. At the board, we have been taking our size very seriously in our efforts to uh, improve the diversity of the economics profession itself. So because we're a big hirer of economists, and because we hire lots of RAs, many of whom then go on to economics grad school, we've been making a big effort to 
improve the diversity of our RA pool and to reach out to economics undergrads or potential economics undergrads to help improve the diversity of the profession. And I think actually just doing that would help us to address a much, you know, would help the profession to address a much broader array of issues. And I think that's another way that we can kind of use our size to our advantage in promoting these types of issues. Um, I also think that, um, you know, another great aspect of the Institute and about this conference has been the interdisciplinary nature of it. And I think economics in particular is a very insular uh, profession and a community. And I think that it's been great that we've had people from a variety of different disciplines here. And I think that that's something that the Institute can consider to uh, encourage through its visiting scholar program, through convening um, conferences like this. And I would like to see, um, you know, and back in our home reserve banks, I think that that's something that we can also all take to heart, thinking about how we can broaden the um, the variety of people who we hear from at conferences, that it shouldn't just be the usual suspects, but to reach out to a much broader community. And I think this conference has been a great beginning for that. All in there. David. OK, I'd like to um, start by congratulating President Kashkari on what has really been a remarkable couple of days. And I, I really appreciate. and the, of course, you didn't do it alone. The staff, too. Um, being a staff member, I like the, the staff. Um, and I, I really appreciate being included in it. It was a great opportunity. Uh, I'm going to make a couple comments. One, kind of a specific research sort of uh, comment, and then a couple general comments about how we might marshal um, the full resources uh, of the Federal Reserve in, in these efforts. So let me start with. Um, this quote from the Statement on Longer Run Goals and Monetary Policy that is voted on by the FOMC at the beginning of every year and basically articulates um, you know, how the committee views the dual mandate. So here's uh, what I think is a pertinent passage. The maximum level of employment is largely determined by non-monetary factors that affect the structure and dynamics of the labor market. Now, the views that I express are not necessarily those of the <laughs> Federal Open Market Committee um, or anyone else. But I read that. And what it means to me is we're concerned about inequality. We're concerned about distributional issues. But look somewhere else for the solution. Um, that is fundamentally what I still believe. But I think we ought to take the challenges to that view seriously, and it is of serious moment because there it is in the definition, if you will, of what the dual mandate means. So for example, I think Bill Spriggs' challenge to this the other day um, needs to be considered. Um, what do we know? Do we even have any examples of experiences where, for example, we can remove, move from regime three, I think I've got the numbers right, where we have a kind of standard, non-linear looking Phillips curve to this very flat Phillips curve uh, area of regime four if we just push a little bit harder and just take some risks. And what are those risks? How long can we push, how far can we push into regime three before expectations become unanchored? And by the way, if they do, so what? It's one thing we never heard, or we, I think we heard one mention kind of slightly having to do with long-term interest rates uh, yesterday about what the distributional consequences are of getting the inflation part of our dual mandate wrong. Sort of startlingly, startlingly lacking in our conversation of these couple days, that little piece of our mandate, uh, which most of us take as sort of the, uh, the one thing that we can be best at controlling. Um, and I might kind of also shout out to then the, the, the um, use of some of the survey data that we, we uh, talked about yesterday as another key part of that. What do we know about inflation expectations? Because what understanding how un inflation expectations become anchored and unanchored uh, 
is key to understanding how far we can test in the real world Bill Sprigg's hypotheses. There are some interesting regularities that we see in the data that have to do, if you take um, high pressure periods uh, in the economy, and I'm defining high pressure periods as periods where the unemployment rate falls below the CBO estimate of, of the natural rate. Uh, one thing you see in those periods quite clearly is a shrinking of the black-white unemployment differential and often quite substantial shrinking. Here's the other thing you see. Might be a little bit of disagreement on this, but here's what I see. Every single one of those periods ends with an NBER shaded bar. <laughs> they all end in recession. Maybe by luck, maybe by bad policy, I don't know. We probably ought to know. But we also know what happens is that black-white unemployment differential blows out again once you hit that recession period. Well, it raises quite a few questions. One is, is this overly aggressive monetary policy, fearful of creating the inflation that these high pressure periods uh, present? Is it just bad luck if you actually point out, uh, print out along with those periods oil prices? Every one of those NBER shaded bars going back to the mid 70s is also associated with an oil price spike. So maybe it's just bad luck, but there's more we ought to know about the shifting differentials. For example, if you allow a high pressure period to run, what happens to the individuals who are drawn into the labor market during that period? Is there a persistent effect, positive effect, on their labor market outcomes um, that perhaps justifies the risk? Um, or does everyone just revert back to the same probability of moving in and out of unemployment, in and out of the labor force um, that existed without that period, making running the risk of creating inflation by being a little bit um, uh, uh, tolerant of these high pressure periods not worth the cost in any event. To do this, we got to get into some micro data. We got to look at people. We got to trace them through time and actually understand what their labor market dynamics look like at the individual level. Finally on this issue, let me endorse uh, Greg Kaplan's call for um, monetary macro models that actually seriously entertain distributional consequences. Um, I say entertain. We don't really need models that um, assume that answer, that we have distributional consequences. These should be quantitative econometric exercises, um, but it ought to be done um, because we are operating in the world where we assume that monetary policy has a limited role, it's a blunt instrument, and it would, you know, in my view and the current circumstance, be a breach of our responsibility if we did not test in many ways, as many ways as we can, the validity of that assumption. Let me turn to this notion of um, uh, the broader efforts within the Federal Reserve. I want to endorse um, uh, and promote the project of exploiting complementarities between the community development efforts in the Federal Reserve and the research efforts in the Federal Reserve. And I think that um, approaching things from um, both of those views can be beneficial, extraordinarily beneficial, to both communities. So let me just give a couple examples. Uh, yesterday in Sandra Samuel's uh, um, uh, great speech, um, there was the sort of a notice of what, what, what's, or there was a comment about what happened, what's the deal with the people who aren't part of your program? And there was just sort of this throwaway line uh, that was, well, you know, every once in a while you hear that someone says that they'll, lo they'll lose their Medicaid benefits and therefore it's not worthwhile. This is a serious deal. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan right now of this paper by uh, um, Alan Auerbach and Larry Kotlikoff and Daryl Kohler. Uh, I think it's revised and resubmitted at the JPE where they calculate wealth, lifetime wealth in a very sort of broad way. Uh, out of the survey of consumer finances um, and tax liabilities or 
tax rates um, very comprehensively, federal, state, netting out all sorts of transfer payments and so on. Um, and they, um, first of all, they'll show you average tax rates. Average tax rates look very progressive. You know, they cut it up by quintile. And then they show you marginal tax rates, which look very not progressive. But that's not really sort of the, the, the part that strikes me. They, they, they give you sort of the distribution of t marginal tax rates that people in different income or, or wealth quintiles, lifetime wealth quintiles uh, face. The maximum, and they give a min and a max. The maximum marginal tax rate for someone in the lowest quintile, 934%, something like that. Um, so I give, I, I, I've been, I've been noting this research in almost every speech. I, I find some excuse to give this research. And I particularly <laughs> like to give this, uh, this research to people uh, working in the community development field. Um, at the Atlanta Fed, all over the system, we're very interested in workforce development. So I asked the following question. What workforce development problem, program is going to overcome a marginal tax rate of 900%? If you can show me that one, I'm going to be impressed. Um, now, 900% is extreme. It's sort of a rare outlier. Um, but 50 to 70, not, not rare. In the lowest quintile, second lowest quintile, the maximum is like 500%. Again, these 50, 60, 70% marginal tax rates are not unusual. Um, and of course, we know why it is. Uh, we, because as the marginal dollar gets earned, benefits get taken away. Now, match that with what Janet Curry was talking about yesterday, the enormous benefit of Medicaid. So a diminution of that program is those dots aren't dots in the chart she showed. Those dots are children. But it comes at a cost, and it's a cost that we got to figure out how to deal with if, in particular, in our community development, workforce development efforts, we want to make a real difference. So this is an example of where kind of taking the research and expanding on that research. And by the way, John Sablehouse, I'm looking for a partner at the SCF to, because that's all done for Ohio. We ought to be doing it by every state and kind of picking this apart uh, and so on. But this is a place where the research connection to the CED effort seems to me to be critical. It goes in reverse. Uh, we now have all districts across the Federal Reserve System engaged in a small business survey. I think there's excess of the sample size is in excess of 10,000 uh, respondents now. 7,000 or 8,000 so in the last uh, survey was um, uh, actual small businesses with employees. A lot of them are single proprietorships. And there was an interesting question asked in, in, in I think, the last one, um, which was, um, are you investment constrained? Do you feel like you, you, there are constraints on expanding your business through capital acquisition? Of those who said the answer was yes, the question was asked why. Um, and, you know, some of it was I can't get credit, some of it was, uh, you know, my growth forecast doesn't justify it. The modal answer, can't find or retain qualified labor. Then they dug in deeper and said, well, okay, you know, small businesses, are, that's a pretty heterogeneous group. Some of them are barber shops, and some of them are, you know, are either the future Google or the company that's going to be eaten up by Google. Um, so they constrained the sample to those that had uh, survived at least six years, that were profitable, that were planning on expanding employment and, and, and capital, but nonetheless constrained. By far, the modal answer there was labor. So this issue of and, and I, I don't know how it's done in every bank. In our bank, this is done out of our community development uh, 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 group. Um, but that ought to be a challenge to sort of uh, to researchers. And again, going back to, to Greg's uh, comments about figuring out, digging in, looking under the hood 
of the sort of employment arrangements and where those capital complementarities really lie seems like a, not only a tantalizing research project, but an important one that is importantly informed by some of the efforts that we do elsewhere in the system. Finally, um, I think I want, I want to make the call for treating our regional and outreach efforts as a, a piece of our research efforts. Um, under the leadership of President Lockhart in Atlanta, early on we sort of adopted this uh, framework, um, the mantra of which was, if done correctly, anecdote is data. Um, that is, we, we're out in the community, we're asking questions, let's take an orientation where we know the questions we want to ask. And by that I mean there's a certain beige booky kind of way of saying, hey, how's business? Um, that's not the question we want to ask. We want to ask questions that help us understand what we do not understand in the data. Um, so if, you know, in, in a current analysis sense, um, you know, we see inventories sort of blowing up, we want to say, well, are your inventories blowing up? Is it because you intend for them to blow up? Is it because you're expecting greater sales? What is go what's going on? inside your business to help me understand this data. The second thing was, is to ask questions in the language of the people we're asking, which I don't know, I won't speak for all economists, I stink at. Um, I'll give, uh, um, and, and, and this is kind of first order stuff. Um, I'm gonna make a claim here. We should never, ever, ever again do any research with the Mich Michigan survey of inflation expectations, ever. Because whatever question we think we're asking those people, that's not the question they're answering. Um, and we know this through lots of uh, kind of side research, and some of it is in from the New York Fed survey. So if you want to know who does it right, it's the New York Fed survey, it's the Atlanta Business Inflation Expectations Survey. You've got to understand exactly what it is you're asking, but more importantly, what people are hearing when you ask it. Um, our original effort in this in Atlanta was, a, was mainly uh, aimed at current analysis, you know, st stuff we could do to kind of dissect the data to take to the FOMC, for, so Dennis could take it to the FOMC. But we have now sort of shifted, feel like we've matured that process. Well, now we've shifted to what I'll describe as sort of channeling our inner sociologist, um, using this field work to actually inform how we might think about constructing our research agendas. So, you know, finding out how to ask questions that might end in data through some sort of survey instrument, how to um, uh, think about taxonomies and case studies that will help us understand how we might want to model under the hood, uh, if you will. Um, I won't say that that process is mature. We're just learning how to do it. And by the way, these are all not economists who go out and do this stuff. These are people who are just smart um, and have become practiced over many years of actually talking to real people. Um, and in the end, this whole conference is about real people, uh, and I think that uh, you know, we can continue using the resources of the Federal Reserve System, in particular the boots on the ground in the Federal Reserve banks, uh, to advance not only kind of our policy interests, but actually our research interests. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, so before I open it up to questions, I have a, a question for the panel. Um, so one of the recurring themes we've had is that uh, both from our side, we, we have a certain expertise in collecting data. And what we've heard from a lot of the people who talked uh, yesterday and today is that there are needs to collect more data. Uh, so with that as a kind of prelude, uh, I want to ask a little bit about that. I'm going to ask, it's, it's a question in three parts, so you may want to write it down. But uh, <laughs> so, so first, Queen. too much work. Yeah, I know. You, you thought this was a vacation? <laughs> so, first, so Sandy uh, gave the example yesterday of some work that he's been doing in collaboration with some of the feds, uh, getting in and looking at uh, data for certain cities. So the first part of the question is, well, so what prevents us from doing that more broadly? 
Um, is it purely a matter of financial resources? Uh, and if not, what is it? Second, the second part of the question is, well, to the extent that it is a question of financial resources, can we leverage the stuff we heard about yesterday from John and Rob about how linking surveys can actually reduce the cost of administering future surveys because we don't have to continually ask people the same questions and nor do we have to kind of bother them with the, uh, the view that, wow, I have to answer the same question again and again. And then lastly, to develop what Philip said yesterday, uh, to the extent that we can afford to do it ourselves, are the ways in which we could interact with third-party vendors of data to try and influence the data that is collected and influence its availability to the research community more generally. So that's a lot, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, any thoughts? Well, so, um, yes, 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 and no. <laughs> something like that. Um, so, well, I mean, I, obviously, what the only thing that, you know, we, one thing that would prevent us is to, um, I, you know, we do have con, con limited resources and there are trade offs, and we have to figure out, you know, where we're going to find those trade offs. I think that this, this event uh, and this institute uh, suggests that, you know, this has moved up the, the um, ladder in terms of our priorities. Um, Linking surveys, I'm, I'm going to leave that to, to Stephanie. Um, Third-party data, we, I, I, so there are others who are a lot more knowledgeable about this in my group. My sense is we become, we're, we're pretty unsuccessful um, at, at those sorts of efforts. Um, a lot of it is pri pri proprietary. It's done for proprietary reasons, and I'm not sure that's our best route uh, uh, forward. I'll just put in the pitch I just put in before, which is, you know, one key here is to leverage all the resources we have. You know, if we've got people uh, who have not traditionally been pulled into this, uh, these activities, but are out there collecting data, let's coordinate. I think, um, actually, I'll uh, address this last issue first in terms of the uh, third party data. So, as I mentioned yesterday, um, when, during the data panel, actually, the board has been, um, you know, making an effort to use these types of data. And I think, actually, it would be good to think about how we can coordinate these efforts across the system. So I was talking afterwards with someone from the Atlanta Fed about using job openings data. So we're looking into that. They've also purchased some data. Can we go in together, the data are very expensive. And so I think there could be opportunities um, because the data do tend to be expensive to uh, try to coordinate that more across the system, although the vendors want to pick you off one by one. <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, I think that using those data, though, are not always very straightforward because, as Philip mentioned, they are created for certain purposes. Often we don't know exactly how different variables are created. And we've worked very hard to negotiate with the vendors that we have been using to get under the hood of what is really going on. And I think, you know, I think there are um, possibilities that we could coordinate with outside researchers who are using different sources of data and try to think about whether there are beneficial relationships in terms of maximizing the usefulness of those data. Um, similarly, I think in terms of linking uh, surveys, or as I've kind of mentioned in my remarks, adding on extra, you know, are there a few extra variables we could add to data we already collect that could make them more useful? I think there are opportunities there. The, I think the more involvement of the Federal Reserve System in these RDCs, actually, I think, could help us to be able to more readily access a lot of those data because a lot of them are housed at the census. And actually, uh, Kim, who's here, has been working with the BLS also to add BLS data to the RDCs uh, as a way to make all those data more available. So I think there is lots of room for sort of improving the availability of the data and gaining expertise in how to um, link them. and. I mean, I think in that sense, also Rob's presentation yesterday was very useful because once someone has done it, are there ways we can make those data readily available so everyone can benefit from that? So one thing that we should always keep in mind is data collection and maintenance are really very costly. 
Uh, at the New York Fed, we invested a lot in the from data sources, and we always want very good people to work with them and to provide that uh, they they uh, they they need to be convinced that this is something good for them and this is something good for the society. And it takes a lot of time time to build definitely for data. And what happens uh, what happens in the macro economy is we are confronted with a question, and to be able to give an accurate answer that relies on micro data, we should have invested in that data source in the last three to four years. And I think even at the, in the Federal Reserve System with the resources we have, we are having difficulty convincing people that this is really worthwhile and we should be investing in these data sources now when the unemployment rate, rate is around 4% so that next time something bad happens, we are ready to answer these questions. I think it's really important to, to be really persistent and continue investing in these resources even when there are no problems in the economy along those dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to begin to open it up, um, but I, rather than just having a free-for-all, let me try and structure it a little bit. Dave has, has talked a little bit about some of the community development uh, operations that we do and how we might want to kind of more systematically collect data from them and how we might want to link research and community development uh, a bit more closely as we go forward. So I know there are some people in community development here. I know from Minneapolis we have some people who've worked on the Early uh, Childhood Development Initiative <coughs> as well as the Centre for Indian Country uh, Development. Uh, do you guys want to chip in with a little bit of what you do, what our capabilities are and, and how we interact research and development together? Sure. Um, my name is Michael Grover. I'm the Community Affairs Officer here at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. <laughs> um, I think the setup was perfect in a way for me to kind of make uh, a few remarks about early childhood development in particular as um, a space where the Minneapolis Fed, um, really starting with Art Rolnick, Rob Grunewald, uh, Dick Todd and others, um, have worked to um, translate research that was being done in academia by folks like J James Heckman and others uh, to translate that information to policymakers, community development folks, and others who are trying to figure out what to do in the field. And take that information, apply it, but also change the information to look at uh, information such as like return on investment, how, um, what should we be doing in terms of focusing some of our investments out in the community, um, and, take, and letting community development kind of run with it. So Josh, I don't know if you can load those graphics, but um, there are two slides here that I'd like to show. Um, and this was through a partnership really with the Board of Governors, um, some of the folks are here today as well. Um, at a recent conference we held in, in March in 2017, um, this is a biennial conference that um, the community development function as a system focuses on, where we try and build, bring together kind of current academic research from a multidisciplinary sort of perspective to focus really on a topic. Um, the topic this time around was something called Strong Foundation strong foundations, the economic futures of kids and communities, and certainly the Minneapolis contribution, both in terms of some of the research that Art had done and others had done, and community development has carried forward in this bank, has really been focused on, in, in this slide, looking at the early investment in kids can pay off. So what's the return on investment for investing in kids at an early age? Um, certainly from zero to three, what are some of the, some of the outcomes that we look at? Um, Josh, the other slide? Um, also, one of the key factors in this is not necessarily focusing just on return on investment, but also the brain science aspects of what's going on um, in, in, in kids at this point in time that we know um, early, uh, later on in their life that these have an important effect. And this would be some of the brain science that, uh, that Heckman and others have been focusing on um, and Shonkoff and others to, and some of the hard research that they've been doing and really our role in community development and across the, the different 12 reserve banks and at the board is how do we translate this information to actionable sort of information that um, policymakers, foundations, um, nonprofits can put into action. So just giving <laughs> a, thanks for the plug mark for being able to do this but this is just one example. And I think Oh, Art, do you want to follow up on that? Just a footnote, um, Art Rolnick, uh, what we did here, we, we tried to take this research, which is kind of overwhelming, that we know if, we, if the kids get a good start with an engaged parent starting at kindergarten, 
that uh, Heckman's work showed that um, uh, it makes a uh, you increase the probability of these kids succeeding in life. So the question is, how do you take it to the real world? And, you know, you heard Sandra yesterday give you some idea of the Northside Achievement Zone, but the tool that we recommended, that Rob and I recommended, you know, it came out of my influence from Milton Friedman many years ago, is very simple. We empower the parent with a scholarship. A scholarship to send their child to a high quality program. That was it. Um, let the parent be engaged, empowered to do that. And the scholarship includes funding. This is based on work by David Olds and the importance of getting to the child as, and the parent as early as prenatal. Um, that our scholarships include funding for a uh, home visiting nurse and, and, and parent coach as early as prenatal. So that was it. And fortunately, we were able to convince policymakers, based on the return on investment, uh, to invest in this. And a couple sessions ago, we got a quarter of a billion dollars, 60 million a year for four years. We're now serving about 10 to 15 percent of our children born into poverty. And as Sandra pointed out, we're getting some very strong results, not just from the north side. We have what we call these transformation zones around the state. We're doing this in St. Paul. We're doing it on a Native American Indian reservation up north. We're doing it in a very low-income neighborhood in um, uh, Itasca County, which is a rural area. Parents are parents. They take advantage of this. Uh, the market works. The critics said, well, you don't have four-star rated programs. You have to use a scholarship and a high-quality program. Well, when the market heard that our parents had scholarships, well-paying scholarships, so the infrastructure has been growing around the state, which benefits all kids. But my point here is that in this case, I don't need more data, David. I don't actually need more research. It is time to actually take the research that we have and it's not just the economic research. You've got the neuroscientists telling us how important that brain development is by age three. So now's the time to do it. We have too many kids born into poverty. Uh, the return on this, the public return on this investment is enormous. Uh, it's double digit. Um, we can debate whether it's 12% or 30%. Uh, in case of the north side, we're getting these double digit returns. We haven't yet. Uh, demonstrated the, uh, the medical benefits yet. We're just starting to collect data on, on, on how much better the child and the parent is doing in this case. So um, I, I'm, uh, like any research, I think we should have more data and more, you know, more research, but at some point uh, it's time to move to action. And I think in this area uh, it's critical that we say, no, we actually know. We have enough research. We know a lot more about the research on child development that we do on controlling the business cycle. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, or don't, you don't want to get me started or building another stadium for a professional sports team. Um, and what, what, is, what, what we need to do at some time, and I think the Fed has been a leader on this, is to say, no, we have enough research now to say, we can always learn more and we can get better. But we do have enough data. And, and David, one, we, this tool that we have, which is early learning scholarships, the, um, uh, the marginal tax rate on that is zero. Uh, these, these scholarships go to the kids, and uh, so, and it's actually, and Sandra didn't get into this, but a lot of our parents are going back to school and going back to work, and their income is going up. So uh, in this case, I want to say, this is the way to take research and make it happen. And I think the Federal Reserve, in a way, if you think about how we're created, we're created to take the incredible research that's going on in macro and interpret it for Washington at the FOMC. So that is our modus operandi, in a way. And I think we have a chance of doing that uh, in this area. And fortunately, with the support of the Minneapolis Fed, we've been doing it. Thanks, Art. Um, <laughs> and to follow up on the Indian uh, country development. Yes, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. I'm Patrice Kunish. I'm the director of the Center for Indian Country Development here at the Minneapolis Fed. The center was uh, launched almost two years ago, and I was brought here to, to lead this effort in an entrepreneurial way with my colleague Dick Todd, who has our research, and, and we work across partnership with our community development. So certainly this is a, a very complementary kind of uh, effort. I'm joined here by Major Robinson, who just joined us in the Helena branch. Both Major and I, are from Indian country. And so we have the real lived experience of what it means to grow up in a community that has some of the most severe socioeconomic disparities. 
So our research focuses on um, uh, housing, education, very much ed early childhood education as well as returns on, in, on, on education. Uh, we're launching, a, we've launched a, a home ownership initiative, so we're delving into the world of, of home ownership and, and really examining why Indian reservations are so locked and trapped and, and sort of immune um, from development. I think we're finding some excellent information and good resources. I should mention, by the way, that we operate on a national platform well beyond the Ninth District. But we know that we have some really significant examples of uh, the real lived disparities here in Minnesota in the Ninth District, and we certainly have strong collaborators. So our work is, is very much focused on research. We also have a, a strong community engagement component. This afternoon, following uh, this event, we will be having a roundtable discussion on home ownership in Indian country, something that we really don't talk about very much. Uh, most of the efforts in Indian country is uh, dominated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, layers and layers and intricate mazes of bureaucracy. And, and really one of our objectives, our big audacious goal is to unlock this development potential and to really improve the, the lives and well-being of our American Indian uh, uh, population. So we're really uh, very happy to be here and, and to have the Fed raise our voices, raise our um, um, uh, visibility. We're one of these other categories that you don't see on many of the demographic population information. I was really happy to see Myron Orfield actually have uh, American Indians denoted in his population uh, demographics. So I've really very much appreciated all of the uh, discussions and I'd love to take a lot of this and, and lay it on Indian country. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I want to open it up uh, a little bit more broadly to anybody who wants to contribute. Um, we're interested in everything you have to say, uh, but particularly, are we on track and what else could we be doing? Uh, so I think, Bill, is that? Um, thank you, and thank you, David, for the shout out. Um, I'm always struck when people show the graph of new firm formation, and it goes exactly with the decline of unions and the increase in inequality. And no one says, gee, the increase in inequality and the decline of firm formation. Um, so my own work, I didn't I, I chose which one of the two I wanted to present here. Uh, I chose the one on labor for a particular reason. But, but if you look at lagged income growth to predict new firm formation, you get this wonderful correlation. I mean, it really is firms need customers. And if you have the type of income growth we've seen, you don't get new customers. You get, you know, uh, it's 1%. So you get 1% of households have income and therefore are potential new customers. No other households are new customers because they have the same income. They can't be new customers. So, so, so when you look at broad, ba when there is broad based income growth, you have many more potential new customers. It's, I'm always astounded that this isn't so self evident. Um, so I think one thing the, the Fed could do is to help um, where the IMF and the OECD have already gone. They have done great research to let everyone know inequality hurts growth. They've done a good job of documenting that. It hurts the sustainability of recoveries. It hurts the, the midterm level of recoveries. Uh, it hurts on the tail end if you're playing too close to going into recession, inequality hurts. It would be so helpful to see the Fed do the kind of research that would validate what the IMF and the OECD have already done and the direction they've already gone in their work to, to underscore this, as well as the World Bank to talk about inequality hurts growth. Um, this, this would be a big breakthrough. And it would be helpful to do more work to look at the relationship between inequality and new firm formation 
because again, it's just the change of the model. It's not aggregate demand that gets firms. Firms don't need more money. They need more customers. Um, and and um, David, I don't know. Is there a question for the small business firms? Because my, my experience and my frustration at the Department of Labor was firms refuse to post jobs through the Public Employment Service. The Public Employment Service is linked to the job training network. The firms would then say, you're not training for the people we need. Did you list the job? No, we didn't list the job. How do you think we know the job exists to train the people for the job if you don't list the job? Um, there was this huge refusal of firms to publicly list openings. It was astounding. Um, so I think it would be interesting to see how intensive their search efforts are. Paul Osterman did a paper on this and found that actually they're they, they weren't so short of employees and their intensity of their search wasn't so great. But it be, would be great in the survey to understand where are they looking, how are they looking. Um, so many of them would say, oh, I went to the local community college to look and they're not training people in the specific machine that's in my factory. And they've never told, they've no, never been in dialogue with community college to let them know what the machine was they wanted them to have. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that would be a, a piece of information that would be helpful. Yeah, so my, my, my own sense of that is that um, we need to do some work before we get to the survey piece of it, because I, I think the survey is going to be too blunt, too general. This is one of those places where I think just, like I said, the word boots on the ground, find out, you know, so you can kind of sit down with somebody for an hour. Uh, and find out why they're making the decisions that they're making. Um, and, you know, are they revealing something to us that's sort of the truth of what is in the survey uh, responses, or is that just disguising some, some other um, uh, driver of their behavior? And uh, by the way, I think we need to do this on both the supply side and the demand side of the labor market, because I don't get the supply side either. Um, I don't understand why, you know, we have employers come to us all the time, and workforce development people come to us all the time and say, look, I can put you through a 12-week training course, uh, and this is going to give you, um, you know, a job, make you qualified for a job that earns, I don't know, throw out a number, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 with a ladder that can lead to six figures. Think of something like auto mechanic, which they're dying for. Why are the... Why, why is there any unopened job? What, what decision are people ma making? And that's one of the things that sort of drew me to this tax stuff. Um, but it's probably more than that. And I think we just, we actually need to do the anthropology, or the sociology, and sort of get on the ground and kind of figure out, um, okay, what are, what are the cases here? And is there a pattern that emerges? And then what do we do about it? So I think, may, you know, and then in the end, you can construct survey uh, instruments once you sort of know better what it is you're exactly trying to ask. And I think we're not quite sure exactly yet what we're trying to ask. Because what we are asking is not getting results that make any sense to us. So if, if I might respond. So we definitely agree with you that if you don't have uh, customers, you're not going to set up a new business. And if you actually look at the growth rate of working age population in the U.S., it co there's a big decline starting in 1980, and it perfectly coincides with this decline. So the channel that we are thinking is this is actually a response to the declining growth rate of population. There's, there are less people entering the labor market. There are less consumers. As a, as a result, we need a, a lower lower firm entry in the, in the economy. And in terms of the link uh, between inequality and this pattern, uh, again, Fatih Guvenen has some interesting work with Nick Bloom and other co-authors. They show that the rise in inequality is coming from the change, increase in inequality between firms. So if you manage to hop onto these really fast growing good firms, superstar firms, you're going to be one of these people who are on the top part of the distributions that I've shown. Otherwise, you'll get stuck on the other side. So this, is, uh, this decline in entry is also causing more concentration in firms and market power. And I agree with you that all of these things actually are very intimately related. And we are, we are trying to understand these patterns better. 
think Bosch, you had your hand up. So I was thinking about a couple of comments about the Institute and its role. So uh, at a personal level, so uh, I, I'm at the Chicago Fed and I did my dissertation on intergenerational mobility many years before it was this popular. And I've also worked on early life health and black-white uh, racial gaps in human capital, all themes that have come up in this conference. Uh, but when I go to academic conferences, a question I often get is, why are you at the Fed? And I think this institute can sort of be uh, an answer to that and saying the Fed cares about distributional consequences and inclusive growth and makes it a place that's attractive for people who might otherwise go to academia to say this is something important to the Fed, even if we never get to the point of how to really incorporate it into policy. Uh, the other point, uh, picking up on Stephanie's comment on uh, data. So I think just one point to make uh, is that <coughs> the stuff Rob talked about, this massive linking of data, there's a lot of, a lot of initiatives underway already through the Census Bureau that I think we, that, that have a lot of potential. And a, a lot of the feds are parts of the RDC network already, like in Chicago, Boston, Atlanta, Kansas City. I'm probably missing some, some that are uh, joining on. And I think potentially the Institute could serve uh, a role in terms of coordinating uh, ideas, both in terms of research that could be done in the RDCs where maybe we could have joint PIs across the feds. Uh, but even outside of the RDCs, I think there could be a coordinating role. So for example, uh, there's a lot of interest in, for example, linking uh, credit bureau data to uh, state UI records to get at the firm aspect of stuff, worker, as, uh, the, the LEHD at the Census Bureau is a data set matching employers to employees. The question of firm data came up yesterday. There have been researchers at different feds who have wanted to try to do this. It's very costly. Uh, the credit bureaus want to charge each fed a lot of money. But there's potential, this is just one example, but there's potential where we could, you know, leverage the system as a whole, find the researchers, you know, maybe the institute could be a, a way of sort of combining uh, the interests across the banks and leveraging uh, the resources. And I think the, the other point I would make is I think uh, the, the Institute could be like a stakeholder in already uh, uh, existing initiatives. So for example, the, um, uh, in Congress, there's now this Committee on Evidence-Based Policymaking. That's been a big uh, driver of the interest in government agencies' willingness to share administrative data and have it linked. And the Fed could play a role through this institute as sort of showing that we're one of the stakeholders who care about this as well. Very good. Thanks. Neil? I have a, a question which is kind of off, off topic, uh, I mean related to this discussion, but a little bit of a uh, tangential, which is underlying a lot of our discussion over the last two days has been this notion of obviously growth versus distribution. We haven't had much of a discussion of international experience. So I have an anecdote in my head or a data point, which I don't know if it's exactly right. I've heard it a bunch of times, <laughs> that in the last decade, something like a billion people around the world have been lifted out of abject poverty. Uh, and now poverty in the third world is very different than poverty in America. Let's be clear, where the starting point is very different. But the, the message underlying that is that growth is enormously important. What can we take away from that? So if, if these third world nations are growing, Obviously, all the rewards are not being captured by the top if people are being lifted out of abject poverty. Is there anything we can learn from that and would apply to the United States? And is that a reasonable question for us to explore as the Fed? Any of you want to step up to the plate on that one? So it is a very difficult question, but one thing, uh, I'm looking at lots of labor market outcomes and comparing the U.S. with other countries. 
But I have the feeling that they learn from us because in, in, in terms of many statistics, we are leading what's happening. US is the only country, maybe along with Canada, where both male and female participation rates are going down. In the UK or in Germany, fem female labor force participation is still not declining. So m my reading of the statistics is it's very hard because other countries are following the US model. So we are ahead of them. And also it goes back to the secular stagnation discussions that somehow US is maybe, US reached the point where things are flattening out and nobody else has been there before. So I feel like they will learn from us, unfortunately, not us from them. But uh, it's a negative answer, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, I definitely do not know the answer to this question. <laughs> Let me just start by saying that. But I do think that it can be helpful to do these international comparisons because it gives us some variation in the market structures. So I think one of the, you know, thinking about participation, I think this is a really interesting example where, um, as I should go said, you know, female participation in particular, the U.S. used to be close to the top in terms of the you know, women participating in the labor force, and now we're kind of in the middle among OECD countries. Female participation started to decline here while it's still rising um, in other OECD countries. And what's going on there, you know? And I think when you think about, you know, obviously, as you said, developing countries have very different economies than, you know, those in the US. But I think it does get to the issue of what kind of jobs are the economies creating? What are the market structures there? So I think, you know, an interesting area of research that people are focusing now are, I can't remember who it was who raised the issue yesterday, I'm sorry, but about issues of monopolies, monopsonies, our technologies, the, you know, these big tech companies, are they natural monopolies? And what are the implications of that for job creation? So I think that thinking about why the market structures are different in these economies, um, what are the social policies that are different can be informative. Okay. Well, I mean, there, it's, the, it's just a uh, very well-known result. Well, 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 I can talk loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's just income convergence, okay? So uh, it's well known that, you know, if you regress, well, anyway, poor countries are gonna grow faster, right? Because they are adopting uh, stuff that rich countries have. I mean, the real puzzle is why they've taken so long, some of them, okay? I mean, finally, they've, you know, they, they get over, they get, you don't have to do many things right when you're really poor to actually start growing a lot. So, um, and so I think some of these countries are growing because they've gotten a few things right. Now, one of the things you'll see though is that all these countries that start growing and catching up to the U.S., they stop uh, quite a bit before the U.S. So like Japan, we always had, the, you know, <laughs> Japan is going to take over the U.S. and there was that literature, right? And Japan has stopped. Japan has stopped their, I don't know, what, where is that? What are they, 80% of the U.S. Uh, productivity? 70. So, you know, uh, and if you, you know, it went up very, very rapidly. And, and, and so uh, China's going to be the same way. China's growing rapidly, but who thinks that China, I mean, if they don't, they may explode, right? I mean, the 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 the, the, the system there is so messed up. So they're they're going to stop soon. So that I mean, I think so. I mean, I think we can learn from them that we do a lot of things right. So that's that's what I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> I like to take a stab at this because I've actually been uh, looking at some of these data that you're talking about. Uh, if you take the example of the Chinese economy, they're structured very differently than ours because they're at a different stage of development. So when they started off into their takeoff into growth, they had a lot of people in the agricultural sector where wages and productivity were was, under, it was low. But as you start to grow, just like in the history of the United States, people migrated to the cities. That's where the leading firms in the economy are. Some of them were able to transition to higher pay, higher paying opportunities relative to a dollar a day. Okay, so we're talking a very low uh, level that we're starting from. So in that situation, when you have very rapid growth, and then you have a uh, population shifting out of agriculture, so this is the sectoral change hypothesis, shifting out of agriculture into the leading uh, sectors of the economy, then what you can have is an expansion, rapid growth, and numbers of people, large numbers of people uh, rising out of poverty. 
So I know Eric's had his hand up for a while. Uh, Eric? Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to double down on what Boss was saying a little bit about data and, and getting access to the data. One of the problems uh, that we run into, <laughs> I noticed that Jay Song's co-authors seem to have gathered over here in this corner. <laughs> and most of you don't know who Jay is, but he is a, uh, he's an economist at uh, Social Security Administration who has access to this amazing earnings data set that, that, uh, that we've used in our research, which is really, really important. But He's the only person in the world who's allowed to touch that data. It is crazy. It is the craziest situation you could imagine. One of the things the Fed is very good at is taking good care of data. And so this is me sort of reaching out to my fellow Fed colleagues uh, to, to reach out to our leaders to try and convince other government agencies, because they're under a lot of fiscal pressure. They can't do with the data what we could be doing to study macroeconomics. And, and what this is about, you know, this whole conference is about the fact that the performance of the macroeconomy is related to what's happening at a micro level, and getting access to these better data sets at Social Security, IRS, and these other places, knowing that the Fed, convincing people that the Fed system is a place where they can trust this data to be used properly, that should be, I think, a real key objective. So John, wouldn't, an, wouldn't part of an answer be to get the SCF in the RDC? If we could, but that's where we have to we have to convince the IRS that we could do that. Just like we have to convince Social Security Administration that Jay Song's data should come out. And basically, as what I'm saying is that it's the realization that that micro data is key to <coughs> macroeconomics. That's what makes it a Fed issue. That's the that's the card we should be playing to try and get this data more widely used. So we have time for a couple more questions. I know Fatih's had his hand up for a while, and Fabrizio. Uh, I, I just want to add one thought to the data issue again. Uh, so the last two days I've been feeling like a kid in a candy store, right? More data, more data, and all the things we can do with it. Um, but one thing that is also, you know, um, was apparent was this um, lag in the availability of consumption data. And uh, I think probably most of the academic economists in this room, you know, at some point use data on consumption, the distribution of consumption. And uh, the obvious reason is uh, it's very difficult. You know, I, I now use a lot of uh, data from European countries. You can get data on wealth, you can get data on incomes, portfolios, anything, but not consumption. Uh, by the, at the administrative level, that's what I mean. So uh, right now the holy grail, you know, uh, for consumption is this app called Mint.com, and many of you in this room actually might be using it. Uh, it's a website, <laughs> that, you know, just uh, for those of you who may not know it, where you go and you enter your financial information. Okay, it's actually owned by Quicken, which is a very you know reputable financial company, and you log in basically your credit card information, your bank accounts, and why do we do this? I am a user actually. Why do I do that? Because in return, I get something, okay? I get reminders about my upcoming bills. It shows my, you know, uh, uh, cash flow, how much money is coming in, how much money is flowing out. Uh, Mint currently has 10 million users. And one of the first economists who used it was uh, Scott Baker, who was doing his PhD at Stanford, and he wrote his job market paper on it. Uh, the idea is, if I know all the components of your budget constraint, then I can construct how much you're consuming at a very high frequency level. Now, the data is not perfect, but it's really, in my opinion, an order of magnitude better than what we had before. The reason I'm mentioning this is uh, there are all these different efforts at collecting data you know, on the internet, surveying people. But those, you know, we have 1,000 households here, 2,000 there. There's attrition, they don't respond. If they respond, are they really being accurate? Um, for consumption, I think we may want to think out of the box. Why can't there be a public version of Mint.com where you, in a way, not clone, but you, know, you do something very similar, and it's done for research purposes. The problem with Mint and related apps is people who sign up for it legally, they actually not often know that they, they, they are going to be used for research. But it can be a data product where the users consent to its use for research. And one example of that is Apple. As you might know, if you have an Apple Watch or iPhone, uh, there's something called Research Kit, where they track your you know, uh, blood pressure, they track your heart rate, and this is being used by reputable hospitals like Mayo Clinic, Cleveland, and so on, for research. And they have millions of users. So I just want to raise this issue, given that there are so many 
people here who are into data collection that I personally think it would be a very efficient use of money. You write the app, people sign up, then you automatically track them as long as they are in there. And that would be a huge public service, I think. You know, I would just love whoever does that, and I will thank you forever. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just about out of time. Uh, one more question. Yes, hello. Um, I wanted to go back to the question that Neil had posed. Uh, I think we've got an interesting dynamic right now. You were talking about comparing <coughs> what we do here in the, in the U.S. with other countries, and certainly in many respects we lead other countries when, when we're looking at how our economy grows and so forth. But um, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic because then within that, as, as Patrice was talking about too, when we look at uh, Indian country, which is a part of the United States, um, we see that disparity. We see the, that, uh, as I tell people, if you want to do international business, go to an Indian reservation because you're actually doing international business there by learning the language, by, by actually you know, speaking from that context. You don't have to know the language, but at least understand that context. And I think when we, the, the efforts that we're focusing on there is part of that, you know, trying to, to bring up all of those in the same sense. Um, so we have that right next door in, or, in order to try to impact in some way. And, um, and I think in a lot of ways we are. I, I love the, the, the whole context that this is being described of, you know, how do we link community development with research and how do we be more effective about creating those tools and having an impact on the ground. Um, so I think that, that there's, it just brings up a really interesting question. How can we, as a nation, be so strong in our economy, yet those Americans as well still are, are struggling and, and suffering in that, in that area? Um, and at the same time, what's really interesting with that um, picture is that American Indians serve at probably the highest rate of any population in our armed services, too. So there's a connection that exists there and, and it's, it's really important. So I think the idea is, you know, how can we go a little deeper with that information, with that data, in order to have the type of impact that we'd like to have. So I think it's certainly worth reaching for that, that, that uh, expectation and raising the expectation, like, like uh, David had mentioned, um, because why shouldn't we? You know, even if it comes in somewhere here, uh, there's an impact that we can make. Thank you. So we're out of time, uh, so please join with me in thanking the members of the panel. And so now it's time for all of us in the FED system to roll up our sleeves and, and get to work. Um, I know a lot of people have to run to make flights, so let me just very quickly uh, sum up. First, uh, you can all expect to be contacted by us again. This is the first conference and the very beginning stages of this institute. We're going to be uh, pushing forward uh, for quite some time. Uh, our plan is to have another conference later in this year and we'll be contacting all the advisors with a view to helping to set that up. Uh, and uh, anyone else who's interested, we'd love to hear from you too. Likewise, we'll be contacting you over the future, soliciting recommendations for our Visiting Scholars Program for next year, as well as other initiatives we'll be pushing. So uh, please uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, before you go, it, you know, it's important I think we acknowledge all the people who are behind the scenes who worked really hard to get this done. Uh, to start listing names is to invite the possibility of missing somebody, so I forgive, please forgive me if I do, uh, but let me please thank uh, Ashley Oliver, Scott Rutke, Paul Wallace, Chris Long, Josh Anderson, Alexis, uh, I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Akavik. Uh, Peter Falanga, and uh, last but not least, Anita Ng, who's been doing so much work behind the scenes. So please uh, join with me in thanking them. <laughs> and let me also thank uh, Neil Kashkari. I, I think, uh, you know, I, this is my second day on the job, so I'm going to you know, suck <laughs> up to him a little bit. But uh, it's really not too much of an exaggeration to say that so much, all of this really belongs to him. This was his initiative, his idea. He's the one who made the cold calls to everybody on the Board of Advisors. He's the one who went to Washington to get the money to, to run this. Uh, and he's the inspiration that drives us forward. So thank you so much, Neil.
And then lastly, those of you who are heading to the airport, your luggage should be outside and there are people there ready to help you get taxis and on the way. So thank you very much, safe travels, and we'll look forward to talking to you soon.